Hey guys and welcome to the channel. Today I will be doing a what if which is what if Deku had dual quirks part 1. If you like this video be sure to leave a like and subscribe. Izuku Midoriya had wanted to be a hero more than anything else in the world, taking inspiration from every pro hero he saw. But one pro hero had more of his attention than any other, All Might, the number one hero. The man who fought without fear and announced to the world, I am here. That's why, when Izuku saw Kaken bullying a kid in the playground, Izuku knew he had to step in. Even though his quirk hasn't manifested yet, leave him alone. Just because you have your quirk doesn't mean that you can bully the weak. Izuku screams he runs between Kaken and the boy on the ground. What the fuck are you going to do to stop me? Use your quirk. Oh, that's right you're quirkless. You can't stop me. Kaken yells as he charges at Deku with sweaty palms ready to be ignited. Deku crossed his arms in front of his face and closes his eyes preparing for a point-blank explosion. As he does this, he feels a strange sensation coursing through his arms. Die fucker. Kaken screams as he detonated more of his sweat than he intended to. The place goes dead silent as they wait for the smoke to clear. As time progresses, Kaken begins to get nervous. Deku should have started screaming by now. Kaken runs into the smoke and smacks into something red and hard. Izuku notices that he hasn't been blown up yet and slowly opens his eyes. Izuku is seeing red. He taps the barrier to see what it is. It's hollow Deku whispers as he knocks on it. What is it? Izuku asks before trying to move it. He searches for that feeling again, taking several minutes to do so. Once he finds this feeling, he grasps it and tugs with all his might. In a flash of red light, the barrier disappears and the smoke begins to rise above them. Once it's revealed that Deku is completely unharmed, Kaken gets angry and charges at him ready to punch his lights out. When Kaken's fist gets close, Deku goes to block it with his arm and that red barrier appears on it as a circular shield. I told you I'm not quirkless, but you guys just didn't listen Deku says as the shield recedes into his skin. Your quirk is just a useless shield, you're not special. Filthy extra, Kaken says before angrily stomping away, silently telling himself that he is still the strongest person in the class. The kid Deku was protecting runs away, but he's too busy thinking about his quirk to notice. I have a quirk. I have a cool quirk Deku thinks as he runs home to his mother. Inko Midoriya is the single mother of Izuku Midoriya. Her quirk is a minor form of telekinesis. She can only attract objects that are smaller than her. So when her son rushes through the door with a crystal-like substance on his right arm, she becomes extremely happy. Her son can fulfill his dreams of becoming a pro hero. I'll schedule a quirk assessment for tomorrow. And Ko says while crying tears of joy. She has been hoping his quirk would activate for months now. Everyone else in his class had already gotten theirs. And my son can do what? And Ko Midoriya asks the doctor in shock. He can create any type of gem by using calories. He can also use those gems to form objects. The doctor says once again. While pointing to the boy sitting on a one foot tall, emerald horse that is walking around. I almost forgot to mention that he has to know what a gem looks like in order to make a perfect copy of it. This means he has to know the crystal's structure and color. He can make crystals that have special properties too. One of his gems set burn whatever it touched, except for him. I quote him rich, and Ko thinks. If this was a cartoon, her eyes would transform into diamond dollar signs. Deku is barely paying attention as he focuses on absorbing the emerald back into his body, but it doesn't work. Apparently, he can't absorb the creation back into his body after it has existed for more than three minutes. Izuku Midoriya has been studying for most of his life. He had to. It was the only way for him to learn how to use his quirk. After the initial incident in the playground, Deku has never used his quirk in front of a classmate, deciding that he'd rather be alone forever than have friends that only like him for his flashy power. He spent most of his time alone and slowly became a background character, being ignored by almost all of his peers. Oh and speaking of powers, Deku has been training himself in order to better utilize his quirk. When he was younger, he found a beach covered in huge pieces of trash. He decided to drag around junk for five months in order to strengthen his body. Then he encased that entire section of the beach in black crystal, doing small sections at a time and taking day-long breaks to recharge, causing the trash to rapidly disintegrate. During this endeavor, Deku silently swore to never use that color crystal on a living organism. He also started learning how to make and use weapons in combat. During this process, Deku figured out that his crystals weren't your average crystals, they didn't always behave like they were unbendable. When Deku made a whip, it behaved like a normal whip by being bendable, but it was still as hard as the crystal it was made from. Ring ring. The school bell snaps Deku back to reality and he packs up his stuff. Nobody pays attention to this and he slips out of the window, falling from the third floor to street level. He encased his legs in pink diamond to absorb the initial damage, and slowly decreased the size of the crystal to extend his landing time. This ends up leaving spider cracks on the ground. Then he absorbs the diamond back into his body. 
He walks home on autopilot while thinking about what he's going to do for the 10 months before UA's entrance exam. Because of this, Deku doesn't notice a dark green sludge monster slowly sneaking up on him until it has already nabbed him. A cute little meat puppet. Perfect. That man will never find me in here. It says to the struggling Deku. This will only hurt for 45 seconds. Deku immediately begins to panic. All of his training has never prepared him for what to do in an actual fight. This panic results in his quirk triggering on its own and encasing him in a ruby sphere, trapping the sludge villain outside. He stays there for three minutes before the sludge villain gets blown away and his sphere starts rolling towards a wall. He crashes into a wall and the sphere shatters on impact, a disoriented Deku being the end result. Young civilian, are you alright? I didn't Detroit smash you into that wall too hard, did I? If I had known that villain was trapping a person, I would have retrieved you first. Deku looks up with blurry vision and sees his hero staring at him with worried eyes. I'm fine all might, just a little disoriented. Izuku responds while trying to stand up. He nearly falls, but quickly forms a blue crystal cane to support him. Very well. But I'm still taking you to a hospital, just in case I gave you a concussion. All Might said before picking Deku up and leaping into the air. I'm fine really, plus you forgot the villain in the streets. Deku says while clinging onto All Might's shoulder. Another hero can pick him up. All Might replies while landing on the roof of a hospital and flexing, Your safety is my main priority. I'm out of time All Might thinks before his body starts smoking and deflating. What's happening? Deku thinks aloud before the smoke clears and a very skinny man with angular features and very long limbs. He has spiky, disheveled blonde hair with two bangs framing the sides of his face. He's also missing his eyebrows. Shit, All Might thinks as Deku bombards him with questions about what happened and why he looks like that. All Might coughs up a geyser of blood and Deku shrieks in fear. Look, this is my true form. I spend 21 hours of the day looking like this. And this is all because of this. All Might says before lifting his shirt and exposing the wound given to him by all for one five years ago. A villain landed a lucky shot on me and obliterated my stomach and a lung. Now, I can only fight for a limited time. You can't tell anybody about any of this. The world needs to believe that the symbol of peace is invincible. Deku agrees to keep quiet, knowing that this secret is too important to not keep, and they go their separate ways. A woman looks at the screen and smoking computer in shock at the caption, Sludge villain detained after meeting Deku. This wasn't supposed to happen. The sludge villain was beaten too early. Now, Deku doesn't have to save Bakugo and impress All Might as a result. This means that Deku won't get one for all before UA. This means that Deku can't impress All Might until the entrance exams. I have to make sure that Deku does something heroic that All Might and the judges will see. If he doesn't get one for all he'll die in the USJ, she said before typing something into the computer. Ten months have passed, and now it's time for the UA. Entrance exam and Deku is doing some last-minute chanting in his room. You can win, you'll do great, you can do this, yeah, out of my way shitty Deku. Kakan growls as he pushes past him and continues walking to the UA. Entrance exams. This push knocks Deku off balance and he starts falling towards the concrete. Suddenly, he feels someone smack his back and he begins to defy all of physics, losing all his momentum and ascending. Are you okay? Asked a voice from behind him and the owner of that voice carefully positions Deku in a way that will make him land on his feet. Yeah, I'm fine Izuku replied calmly before gravity decides to function normally and he lands on his feet. Are you sure? He seemed to have it out for you she said before introducing herself as Achako Yuraka. Izuku Midoriya and I'm sure I'm fine. He just has a big ego. Big enough to fit a city or two Izuku responds, reassuring Achako that nothing is wrong. Okay, good luck during the exams. She smiles and walks away leaving Deku to walk to the exam room alone. Deku is sitting in his designated seating area next to Kaken and barely listening to present Mike. Just stay out of my way or I'll fucking kill you Kaken whispers, but Deku doesn't react. Soon enough, everyone is being led to the buses that'll take them to their battle centers and Deku sees a familiar face sitting at the back of the bus. Achako is sitting with a nervous smile on her face and her fingers playing with her brown locks of hair. Deku sits next to her and starts talking to her, hoping to distract her from being nervous. They talk until they reach their destination and the exam begins. Deku and Achako split up at the start, with Deku hopping onto a giant eagle made of yellow crystals and flying into the fray. He decides to play smart and stay on the rooftops to attack the robots that were stationed there. He decided to do this because he wants to have his own robots to fight without worrying about kill stealers. Deku creates a 20 inches long sword made of a clear crystal, and he examines his prey. Ten robots armed with guns, swords and guns that shoot sword. Let's rock. Deku whispers before charging into combat, immediately parrying a sword strike from one of the robots before impaling its chest and using it to block a hail of rubber bullets. Deku kicks the robot off his sword where it falls to the ground with a clang. Izuku casually steps over its sparking wound to reach the next robot. 
This robot has a flamethrower in its chest, forcing Izuku to run around it in a circle, inching closer after each revolution. Three minutes later, Izuku is close enough to slash at its knees. Losing a leg topples the robot, making it easy for Izuku to stab down and pierce its head. One of the robots with sword guns starts to fire its 30 inches long dull gray sword. Deku swings his sword at the flying swords, hitting the first two and knocking those into the other ten. Once the sky is clear, Deku performs a jump slash and vertically bisects the robot. Two of the gun robots begin to change form. One folds backwards to reveal a minigun that was hidden in its chest and the other becomes a mini tank that fires explosives. Great, somebody played too much underwatch, Deku thinks as he creates a ruby red shield that is big enough to cover his entire body. After two minutes of taking damage from heavy artillery, the shield starts cracking and the robots run out of ammo. Deku launches his shield at the robots, sweeping the rest of them off the roof and plummeting to their destruction. He dives off the roof, free-falling several feet until he has his eagle swoop by and grab his shirts and its talons. Deku forms a dozen mini pinkish-red orbs in his left hand and he drops them letting the orbs plummet down towards a group of robots. The orbs morph into dozens of baby birds that home in on each robot below. Upon reaching their targets, they all explode, leaving behind nothing but craters two inches deep. The other applicants turn to look at the explosion and look on in awe as they see Deku flying above the city dropping bombs in areas full of robots. Fortunately, those areas didn't have any organic life in range of the explosions and the other applicants could pick off the damaged survivors. Unexpectedly, a building collapses, sending rubble and debris falling to earth. Deku is about to fly away when he notices two people about to be crushed. This seems like a little bit too much for an entrance exam, thought Deku as he swoops in to grab them. He grabs Achako himself, while the eagle grabs the guy with blonde hair and indigo eyes. Their combined weight is too much for the eagle and they begin losing altitude, so Deku lands on a nearby building while hoping that it doesn't collapse too. Thanks Izuku said Achako as they touch down. This is a magnifique bird. It almost shines as bright as me the blonde man says, his body seems to be sparkling. No thanks are necessary, I'm just doing what any hero would do, Deku proclaims while sheepishly rubbing the back of his head. It was still cool how you swooped in like a knight in shining armor to save a complete stranger instead of getting more points the blonde man replies. His sparkling hasn't stopped yet. Anyways, we can't stay up here forever, the exam is still ongoing. I'll make another bird to carry you, while I grab a Chaco Deku states while making a smaller yellow eagle. They all climb onto the back of their bird, the blonde man clinging onto its neck, while a Chaco clings onto Deku. As soon as they take off, the building collapses to reveal a giant robot. It's the Zero Pointer. Achako screams, we have to smash it, or else those giant minigun arms will decimate everyone without a quirk made for speed or defense. Blonde guy, start evacuating the area. And if you find that guy with engines in his legs, convince him to help. There's bound to be people that can't see the robot because of the buildings in the way. Deku commands before sending the blonde guy's bird towards the group of people running away. You can count on me he shouts during his descent. What's my job? Achako asks, her eyes filling with determination. I'm about to try cutting off the minigun arms. When I do I need you to make them weightless. That way I can grab them and keep them from accidentally firing upon impacting the earth. Deku instructs as he makes a longer brown crystal sword with sharp diamond edges that is about 13 inches long. The zero pointer's right arm points at the crows of running applicants and starts spinning, creating an eerie yellow glow that is hard to see thanks to the sunlight. Change of plans. Deku screams as he hastily turns around to chase after the fleeing applicants. Once he gets above the group, he raises both hands in front of his body and starts crafting a 50 feet tall rectangular blue diamond barrier. The barrier is holding up fine until the second minigun starts firing rubber bullets too. The sound of diamond cracking halts all of the runners and they turn around to see Deku defending them. Don't just stand there, take cover, shouts Deku as another piece of the barrier cracks. Izuku, look out. Achako yells as she pulls him down to his knees. A rubber bullet shoots through the area his forehead used to occupy. Another bullet punches through and smacks Achako in her elbow. Her pain-filled scream makes Deku snap. His vision goes red, and his hands gain a noticeable, rhythmic twitch. As soon as the bullet storm ends, Deku swoops down and deposits Achako in the crowd. He blitzes the robot, his eyes full of rage. He carves through the chassis on his first flyby and immediately makes a vertical turn. He slices the minigun arm in half and the separated piece lands with a heavy thud. Afterwards, Deku loops back around for the other one. The robot smacks the eagle with its minigun and shatters a wing. Deku spends a minute figuring out what to do after he crash lands. The minigun starts spinning once again and Deku makes a split-second decision. He stomps the ground and clear crystal begins spreading across the ground destroying his right shoe in the process. It surges up the mechanical menace's legs and the rest of the body. 
The crystal begins to squeeze together. As it gets tighter and tighter, the sound of metals being crushed fills the air. Soon nothing is left but a metal sphere with leaking oil and wires randomly sticking out. Deku falls down to his knees in exhaustion before passing out completely. His sword shatters along with his eagles, leaving crystal shards scattered across the battleground. Shards that some kids, like Yuga, casually shove into their pockets. Time's up. Present Mike screams over the paw system. Man, I'm hungry. Deku thinks as he opens his eyes to see a white ceiling. Gah, why would anybody use a white that bright? Deku yells as he sits up. It helps us tell if an area is dirty a short old lady responds. Your recovery girl, the youthful heroine. Deku says as his stomach rumbles loud enough for recovery girl to hear. Your own quirk made you collapse from starvation recovery girl states. Yeah, I need to use calories in order to make my crystals, but I never know how many calories I need before a fight. He explains as his stomach roars. Let's see what I can do about that. Recovery girl hums as she dives through some drawers. Ah, here it is. What is that? Izuku asks as he examines a plain looking chocolate bar wrapper. A candy bar that's full of calories, but tastes like crap. Recovery girl answers as Deku bites into it. Gross. It tastes like someone dipped a dog turd in cool ranch. Deku complains as he chews it. Why do you know what that tastes like? Recovery girl asks, a frown slowly creeping onto her face. I used to get bullied before my quirk activated. Deku answers before trying to swallow the food it takes several attempts, each one accompanied by a gag. Ugh, who made that piece of crap? They need to be arrested for a crime against my taste buds. He groans after finally forcing it down and suppressing his desire to paint the floor black and yellow. He died three years ago. You can't arrest a corpse. Recovery girl replies, mentally suppressing her anger at a kid being force-fed dog excrement. Deku begins to seriously consider finding and pissing near his grave. But before that thought process can proceed any further a knock on the door catches his attention. Come in, recovery girl says, before the door opens and Achako walks in. Her eyes, they look so sad Deku thinks before resolving to change those eyes, no matter what. Hey, Izuku, how are you feeling? Achako asks timidly. I'm feel great, like I could take on 100 giant robots without breaking a sweat, Deku answers, causing Achako to giggle. Okay, but try to avoid passing out again. I was worried about you. She responds while swiftly jabbing her index finger into Izuku's chest. You're free to go recovery girl states after giving Deku two more of those candy bars. What are those? Achako questions, tilting her head in confusion. Evil chocolate that fails at doing the one job it was supposed to do. Deku explains as he grudgingly shoves them into his pocket. Oh, okay. I'll see you at UA. Achako says after remembering that Deku was the one with the highest score. Wait, how long have I been out? Deku asks. When Deku learns that he's been out for a five days, he sighs in relief. Last time, he was out for three weeks. Did you remember to floss? Yes. Did you remember to grab a handkerchief? Yes. Did you remember to? Yes, Izuku cuts her off. Okay, stay safe. Inko Midoriya responds as her son hurries toward the door to catch his train. I always do. He yells back. That school is dangerous, but I know he can handle it. I helped train him after all. Inko thinks as she tilts the picture of Izuku on the wall and it opens up to reveal a metal staff, a sword, and various other weapons. She pulls the staff off the wall and begins to spin it around. Maybe I'll call Mitsuki and set up a sparring match. Deku slips into the classroom unnoticed and finds a quiet place to sit, which just so happens to be next to Shoto Todoroki. You look bored. Deku states, I didn't come here to make friends and play nice. Shoto responds, I came to be a hero and prove my father wrong about me. I'm going to show him, and everyone who doubted me when my quirk was inactive, that I can be a dependable hero, Deku replies, unknowingly striking a chord inside of Shoto. For the first time in years, Shoto decides to reveal one part of his backstory. My father drove my mother to insanity in an attempt to create an heir that could surpass all might, something he could never do. I reject the flames he gave me and will only use my mother's eyes to become a hero. Your dad sounds like a prick. Deku responds. Shoto lets out a snort. That's the understatement of the era. He's a monster pretending to be a hero. Seeing that Shoto has shared his story, Izuku decides to do the same. My dad left me at age 4 because I was misdiagnosed as quirkless. He beat my mother for creating a defective little brat and accused her of spreading her legs for another man because there's no way that he could have played a part in my creation. He took a job overseas and never looked back, leaving my mother in tears and me to pick up the shattered remains of my family. I reject the quirk I received from him and only use my crystals, which is the quirk of my mom's granddad. What did your father pass down? Shoto asks, his curiosity slightly rising. The power to use the elements I consume for breath attacks. Deku answers. This discussion is interrupted by their teacher arriving and sending them to get dressed in their gym uniform. Deku and Shoto get dressed and head outside, standing silently as the task is explained. 
multiple tasks, last place means expulsion. Neither of our protagonists are phased by this and they prepare to dominate whatever task is given to them. Midoriya, your score was the highest one in the entrance exam, so you'll go first. Use your quirk to send this ball as far as you can without leaving the circle. Fine, Deku replies as he pulls off his jacket, exposing his muscles for everyone to see. Izuku would later swear that he heard somebody whistle from the sidelines. Why are you stripping? Shoto asks with a deadpan. I can only create crystals from exposed parts of my body. Deku explains as his chest starts to glow blue and sparkle. Three minutes later, a catapult shoots out of his chest. The 20 feet tall catapult is made of green emeralds, from the wheels up to the sling and pouch. Deku deposits the small payload into the pouch and primes it for launch. Let it fly, Izuku thinks as he mentally yanks down the counterweight. The ball flies into the air, escaping the pouch, and travels approximately 2,000 meters. Deku puts his shirt back on and goes back to standing next to Shoto. This entire scene catches the interest of a black-haired beauty, another creation quirk user. She thinks as a smirk tugs at her lips, very interesting. Deku stops paying attention to what's happening until he is called up for the 50-meter dash. For this task, Deku removes his shoes. Now he's in a pair of socks that would kill almost any fiction his next move will create. As soon as Aizawa says to start, Deku covers the ground in Ristol and slides across it like he's skating. He reaches the finish line in 4.5 seconds and this catches the attention of Shoto. Copycat. Shoto mutters as Deku walks back to him. The ball throw comes up again and on Shoto's turn he tosses the ball before stomping the ground. A trail of ice follows the ball, periodically creating an ice spike to keep the ball airborne. Once it passes 900 meters, Shoto lets it hit the ground. The grip strength test ended with Deku scoring 600.6 kilograms by encasing it in a thin layer of crystal and mentally squeezed the crystal closer together, squeezing the device too. Meanwhile, Shoto gets a solid 70 kilograms. Shoto Todoroki came in first, then Momo, and finally Izuku Midoriya in third place. All the way in last place is Minor Umaita. Pack your stuff and get out, you're officially removed from UA. High school, Aizawa tells Minta. The rest of one ascends pitying looks towards the vertically challenged kid as he drags himself back to the class to grab his back. He didn't belong here. All he did was stare at the girl's asses. Shoto thinks, that's unfortunate, he didn't have a chance. Deku muses, that's one less person staring at my chest all day. Momo celebrates. All right everyone, make your way to ground Charlie. We're doing a drill on evasion and pursuit. Aizawa announces. You'll be split into two teams. The heroes will chase the villain or villains through the fake city. Their job is to capture the villain before they get to the finish line on the other side of the cityscape and escape from the city. The only rules here are, no maiming or attempted murder. The top three from the quirk test will go first in a two versus one match. Aizawa states before Achako asks are the losers getting expelled. No, there's no penalty for being defeated here. Okay Achako replies. So, you're my partner. Deku says as he examines the girl in front of him. Yes, so we need to make a strategy to take down Iceman over there. Momo responds before asking what his quirk actually does. I can use crystals to create almost whatever I want by using my calories. As long as I know the crystal structure, I can change the properties of the crystals while I'm making them and reshape them from a distance. I can also absorb them back into my body as long as they hadn't existed for five minutes or more. Deku informs Momo, shocking her with how similar their quirks are. Also, my own quirk will kill me if I use it too much. That makes sense. If you use too many calories, your body will enter starvation mode because it's out of energy for bodily functions and it might even enter catabolysis in order to prolong your life. Momo reasons. Shota gets five minutes to hide before the heroes can begin their pursuit. Aizawa says, before Shoto sprints into the city. Well, we get five minutes to plan our strategy. Deku comments before Momo drags him away from their classmates. Got to keep your strategies secret until you implement them. Five minutes pass in the blink of an eye, but the two of them have a fairly decent plan. Pursue. Aizawa draws. Momo makes a megaphone and Deku makes an emerald eagle for them to fly on at building level. When they're in the air, Momo creates two H-watches that fire 400 explosive arrows each. Deku coats the tips in pink crystal that will allow them to home in on Shoto. Momo hands Deku the megaphone and he begins speaking. Surrender now villain, or our H-watches will blot out the sun with arrows. Good, I was dreading having to fight in the sunlight. Now I get to kick. Shoto shouts back as an ice spike shoots up from the ground beneath them. I didn't sign up for this. Momo yells as Izuku tilts the bird to avoid the tip of the ice spike. Izuku looks down to see a barrage of ice needles incoming. Beginning defensive maneuver 36B. Izuku shouts as the bird flies directly at the needles before the wings fold up to cover Momo and Izuku. The needles shatter on impact and Izuku begins unfolding the bird. As soon as the bird is completely unfolded, Momo activate the H-watches. The 400 arrows rocket into the air and immediately turn 9 Tidig, entering a back alley. 
They were serious. Shoto thinks as he summons an ice wall. Arrow after arrow bombards the wall, and it breaks after the twelfth arrow exploded. Shoto reacts to this predicament by touching the ground to craft an ice dome that freezes the remaining 387. It didn't work Momo size as the dome forms. Here comes the boom. Izuku whisper yells as he lobs a ruby red gem at the dome and snaps his fingers. Red orbs explode at the snap of the creator's fingers or if they get hit with enough force. This one's detonation is enough to cause a chain reaction of explosions. Shards of ice shrapnel spread out in all directions and Izuku is forced to block them with the underside of the bird. Do me a favor and steer Kevin. Izuku creates a pink sword as he jumps off the bird and dives towards Shoto's alleyway. How? Momo shouts after him. You're a smart girl, you can figure it out. He says as he impacts the ground, landing on one knee with a fist on the ground. Why didn't your legs break? Shoto demands as he throws a dagger of ice at Izuku. That was an incredible distance. Crystal legs help make me immune to fall damage Deku replies as he dodges before charging towards Shoto. Not so fast. Izuku yells as his pink sword shatters, turning into a wave of pink crystal shards that look like flower petals. I call this move Senbin Zakira or Thousand Cherry Blossoms whichever you prefer. Hit me with your best shot, your best pink, girly, floral shot. Shoto shouts as he gets cut by a wave of crystal shards. Shoto sprints out of the alleyway, starting a chase sequence. The crystal shards reform into a sword and Izuku pursues him into a building. Shoto jumps through a glass window and continues his sprint, leading Izuku into the streets. Get off your beautiful ass and help me Izuku yells at Momo. You look like you were fine on your own, but I guess I can exert myself, Momo replies, silently filing that beautiful ass comment away for later. Momo opens up her shirt, revealing that she was wearing a dark blue bra, and her stomach glows blue. A grey, flash grenade launcher slides out of her stomach and she begins taking pot shots. I hope you brought sunglasses, she shouts as a grenade goes off in front of Shoto. With a sharp, ear-piercing boom, the grenade explodes and blasts Shoto with blinding white light. G.A.H., it's like walking in on Fayumi naked in the shower. He screams while rubbing his eyes. Have you ever heard of a railgun? Momo asks while pointing a gun at him. This gun is sparking with electricity. Are you crazy? That could kill me. Shoto shouts while blindly running towards the finish line. Don't get hit then Momo whispers as she changes targets to a billboard sign and pulls the trigger. Crack. Groan. With one last creak, the sign falls from its position and blocks off the most direct path to the exit. Damn it, Shoto ducks into a back alley. That railgun could instantly take me out by breaking a leg and I have no idea where Midori is. A sapphire pegasus lands in front of him, making Shoto silently curse Izuku. Speak of the devil. Shoto thinks as he closes his right hand and shoves it forward, ice knuckle. A fist made of ice shoots out of his fist. The fist shatters one of the Pegasus's left legs and Deku falls off from the shifted balance. Fuck you, you crippled Steve. Now his dream of winning the horse tap dancing contest is ruined. Izuku says as he drops his crystal sword, Senbin Zakura Keijoshi. The sword shatters into pink cherry blossom shaped shards again. But more shards fly out of Deku's torso. This has the side effect of tearing his shirt apart. Or vibrant scape of a thousand cherry blossoms, whichever you prefer. The Japanese works better here. But let me get this straight, Senbin's Akira Keijoshi just makes more flower petal crystal shards. Shoto ducks under a wave of crystal shards. That's not very creative. He pauses between each word to barely dodge an attack. By the end of it, his left arm is bleeding profusely. It's working, isn't it? Izuku asks with a taunting smile on his face. I'm ending this here Shoto Aizawa says over the intercom. Shoto is going to bleed out here, which wouldn't look good. This is just a flesh wound. Screw off blood loss. You're not bringing me down. Shoto grits his teeth and freezes his arm. This kid Aizawa grins fine, carry on. Sugi no Mai, Harukan, or next dance, white wave. Whichever you prefer. Shoto says his ice particles flow from the ground. His hand glows white and he shoves it forward. Izuku gets hit by a wave of cold air that flash freezes him. Jiororar. When I get out I'm going to trap him in crystal and show him what this feels like just wait until I roll you like a giant bowling ball, Deku thinks as he closes his eyes. Shoto runs away and turns around a corner. He looks forward and sees the finish line dead ahead of him. Nice try Midoriya. But I win Shoto thinks as he gets closer to the exit. His hand is about to reach past the exit when something grabs his shoulder and lifts him above the ground. It's Kevin's talon. Momo finally figured out how to make it turn. Nice try. But we win Momo declares while handcuffing his left arm to Kevin's leg. Shoto refuses to lose like this, so he raises his right arm to the underside of the bird. Ice to meet you, but you frost so easily. Ice spreads all over the bird, encasing both wings, and Kevin loses the ability to move his wings. Mayday, mayday, we're going down. Momo yells as they clip the side of a building and lose a wing. Left wing down, she thinks as she tries to avoid the white building in front of them. Without the other wing, it's futile though. 
Abandon ship. She screams as she creates a red hang glider and jumps off. The bird shatters against the building, slamming Todoroki into it face first. Shoto falls off the wall after getting knocked out on impact. He crash lands, shattering the ice around his arm. Momo lands nearby and creates a gurney. She picks up Shoto and gently lowers him onto it. She opens her shirt again. As her chest glows blue, a roll of bandages, a towel, and disinfectant slides out. After treating his wounds to the best of her ability, she wheels him over to Midoriya's ice prison. She opens her shirt again and after a few moments of her chest glowing blue, a flamethrower slides out. Four minutes later the inside of the ice prison has melted enough for Deku to break himself out. I see that we won, Deku states while gesturing to the unconscious Shoto. That was awesome. Achako shouts as Deku, Momo and Shoto. How did you do that sword trick? Mina asks. Forget the sword. Did you see that railgun? Toru interjects. It rocked Kyoka replies. We still have more matches to get through. Quiet down and let's get this done. Izuku and Momo carry Shoto to recovery girl. Aizawa draws. First day and I already have to treat someone with hypothermia. Dangerous amounts of blood loss, a broken nose, blunt force trauma and excessive cuts. This usually doesn't happen until the sports festival, recovery girl says as she kisses Shoto's arm. Deku winces at this. He never meant for Shoto to lose that much blood. Go back to class, he'll be fine. I promise, recovery girl says as she ushers them out the door, he's in capable hands. You're a very violent person Momo says as they walk back to class. I'm not sure you can talk, Miss Railgun. I'm not the one who brought a motherfucking gun to an element fight. Izuku retorts. That's better than what you did, Mr. Senbon's Akira Joshi. I didn't cut skin at all, but it'd be easier to figure out how much of Shoto's skin wasn't cut thanks to you. Momo puts her hands on her hips. That's his fault. He chose to keep dodging instead of taking any of the other options. Izuku claims. What other options? Momo asks while raising her eyebrow. Oh, I don't know. How about begging for mercy? Giving an unconditional surrender or freezing the crystal shards? Izuku smirks at the look on Momo's face. Why would he surrender? He beat you Momo questions. Yeah, he won. But in a real fight he'd have bled out or died from hypothermia. His best hope is a draw. How can you talk about people dying in such a casual tone? I watched a lot of anime before getting out of bed today. Which ones? Attack on Titan, Bleach and Helsing Ultimate. That explains it Momo sighs before the hall is filled with the sound of rumbling. I'm hungrier than I thought they say simultaneously. Momo's head facing the ground to hide her blush. I'm stat having. I had to make a fucking bird and a flying horse. Izuku whines. He feels like he could actually eat a horse now. Why must you be so vulgar? Momo sighs. I grew up around Kakin for my entire life. You kind of just passively absorb some of his personality after prolonged exposure to it. He had the teacher pets swearing like sailors in less than a year. Izuku chuckles. Really? He can't be that bad. Momo says. Just wait for him to get talkative again. He's being uncharacteristically quiet for some reason. He can string curse words together in a way that baffled our last English teacher. Especially when his final essay for the year turned out to be about all the different ways to use fuck in a sentence. Izuku replies, with a proud smile on his face. Even though Kaken and Deku don't agree on a lot of things. Their uneasy peace treaty became uneasy friendship at the tail end of the last school year when Deku got into UA. And proved that he wasn't completely useless. Katsuki's ego was relatively unaffected because he still believes he has the better quirk. His doesn't have a chance to kill him after all. They aren't best buds, but they can talk to each other without something exploding every three minutes. They even started to redo their childhood plan for what they would do when they found the shitty fucktard that ditched Inko because of a misdiagnosed quirk status. I have a chocolate cake in my bag. Deku states after his stomach starts screaming at him, do you want a slice of it? Sure, let's go. Momo replies, nearly dragging him back to the classroom. Wait, I can walk on my own. Izuku shouts as Momo begins to increase her speed and soon Izuku isn't even touching the ground anymore. Note to self, mentioning cake gives her super speed. Izuku thinks as he has flown to class 1A. They arrived at class in no time and began to inhale the chocolate cake with chocolate frosting. This was the moment when Deku realized something. She eats like one of those rich people I see on TV shows. When she saw that Izuku didn't bring forks, she quietly gasped in shock, but not quiet enough to stop him from hearing it. She made metal forks and also made napkins for them to use. After every bite of cake, she would wipe the frosting from her lips with a napkin instead of licking her lips clean. Deku swallows the cake in his mouth before asking the question bluntly. You're a rich girl aren't you? Yes. What does her family even do? I come from a long line of rescue heroes on my mom's side of the family. My creation quirk came from them. My dad is a wealthy CEO that runs the best support company in Japan. What about you? Momo says while hoping that she doesn't sound like a braggart. My mom is a chef, but we make most of our money by selling the gems I make. Izuku replies. Is that even legal? 
Yes, as long as I make it clear that they were made by a quirk, I'm allowed to sell them at half the usual price. We had our lawyer check the quirk laws. Izuku replies while creating a jade then absorbing it. You can absorb your crystals back into your body. Momo says in awe. Yes, but only if they haven't existed for longer than five minutes. You can't absorb your creations. Though, my creations are permanent as soon as they leave my skin. Momo answers. That's unfortunate. You're going to be hungry after every battle Izuku thinks. Can you manipulate crystals that you didn't make? Momo asks after swallowing another piece of cake. I don't know. Most of the gems I've seen in reality were made by me. Izuku replies. They spend the rest of the class time talking and eating. They don't even notice that the day ended until Aizawa cams back and started talking. Looks like you two had quite the party while we were gone. Aizawa says while looking at the cake frosting on Izuku's lip did you at least save some for me? It wasn't a party. Both of our quirks require us to eat a lot. She needs the fat, I need the calories. Izuku explains while pointing at a plastic container and yes, we saved you too. Great, I love chocolate. Aizawa says. Also, the two of you owe me a two-page essay about why overkill shouldn't be used in a training exercise. It's due by the end of this week. Aizawa grabs the cake and climbs back into his sleeping bag go home. He says before rolling over to look at the wall. That wasn't overkill. I could have crushed every bone in his body with two moves. Izuku thinks to himself. Yes, that was overkill Aizawa says. Get out of my head Izuku thinks. No Aizawa says. How are you doing that Izuku thinks? I'm excellent at reading people. Plus you're mumbling everything you think. Izuku shakes his head before saying see you tomorrow. Eraser head. Izuku drags Momo out of the room and towards the exit. That was Eraser Head. How did you know without seeing his quirk? Momo questions. He's the only hero that looks like a Zenjutsu cosplayer. Oh, today, Class 1A is learning how to perform bodyguard missions from All Might. He brought in one of their upperclassmen to act as the VIP they needed to protect. The upperclassman, Mirio Takato of the Big Three also known by his hero name, Lamillion. A blonde male with big strong arms and a quirk straight from Izuki's worst nightmare. What makes this quirk Izuku's worst nightmare? It can't be beaten with conventional methods. No amount of physical effort would stop a quirk that allows the user to ignore physical attacks and traps. Anyways, the reason Lemillion was the chosen VIP was because of this. He could avoid being hurt if something goes wrong like, I don't know, maybe an overexcited Denki unleashing an indiscriminate shock while they were standing on a conductive material or Izuku deciding to repeat the events of yesterday. Alright young heroes, today you'll be learning the second most common job of a combat hero, bodyguarding. A hero must learn how to protect the client from all forms of danger even if it isn't villain related All Might announces before getting interrupted by half the class screaming. All Might follows the class's gaze to the ceiling where he sees a face protruding out of it. Ah, uh, I was wondering where you went. Students, I brought you a playmate. This is young Tagato. Now remember to play nice. I'm looking at you three his stare shifts towards Izuki, Shoto, and Momo. I heard about what you did yesterday. No sending each other to recovery girl. Bite me Izuku mutters. I heard that. All Might replies. Your lesson Mirio reminds him as he falls through the floor. Naked. I got it Momo and Izuku say together. Izuku makes a wall to block their view of Mirio's body. While Momo opens her shirt to create a copy of the third year's gym uniform. While this is going on, Izuku is shooting death glares at Denki Kaminari. Who is subtly staring at Momo's chest. I wonder if I can attack him without getting caught by All Might. Izuku mumbles. What happened to your hero costume? All Might asks once the naked boy is covered. Meanwhile, Izuku is reabsorbing his crystal barrier. Destroyed, again. Mirio sighs. When is your replacement coming? All Might asks. Special suits made of the wearer's hair are always tricky. Two to three weeks Mirio responds. Okay all. Might turns back to his class you'll be put into teams of two heroes and two villains. But due to young Mainta's departure, one match will be one hero versus two villains. A chill travels down Izuku's spine. What are the odds I'll be that solo hero? We'll be doing that match first just to get it out of the way. Izuku gulps. Hiroshima versus Toru and Mina. Izuku sighs in relief. Cosmic revenge has been avoided. All Might soon begins explaining their objectives. After 10 minutes, the villains will attempt to invade and kidnap Mirio. Now, Toru and Mina, you two are allowed to do whatever you want in order to succeed. Hiroshima. Your job is to protect Mirio for 15 minutes after the villains arrive. Who do you think will win? Momo asks Shoto and Izuku. Shoto shrugs I haven't really seen enough to know who. The full extent of Mina's acid is still shrouded in mystery. My notebooks don't have enough data on these three, so I can't make more than an barely educated guess. But Toru and Mina have the advantage in numbers. Although, Toru can become completely invisible. If she can sneak in and grab Mirio while Mina causes a distraction. Izuku trails off once he sees Momo's eyes light up. The girls will win. Momo is almost giddy at the thought of her friends kicking ass. They almost miss Kirishima escorting Mirio to the fake home he chose from the listed options. 
Once they enter the building, Kirishima immediately gets to work. He locks both locks on the door and pulls down the blinds on the windows. He repeats this process for every window in the house before moving on to the side and back doors on the first floor. Good so far, Mirio thinks while he smiles but will he remember to do the second floor too? Come on Mirio, I'm about to scout the second floor of this house. I want you to stay behind me at all times and to duck under every window. Kirishima orders. It turns out that the fake bedroom has a door that leads to the balcony. So Kirishima locks it and pushes the bed against it to prevent that door from swinging open. I need to use the bathroom Mirio said abruptly. Fine, I'll stay posted next to the door Kirishima replied. What if they come through the bathroom window while your back is turned? I'll break the door down and intercept their attacks. The doors are soundproofed. You'd never hear the attack or my screams. I feel like you just want me to come in the bathroom with you. I plead the fifth, Mirio replies. That's not how it works and this isn't America. Just do it. What's the worst that could happen? Oh god, what the hell did you eat? Kirishima gags again as the smell of death hits his nose. Taco Bell. Mirio answers it just goes straight through me. I'll never be able to eat there again Kirishima thinks to himself. Before it hits him. Did you just make a pun? This isn't the place for puns bro. Kirishima responds with a disturbed yet shocked look on his face. Luckily, Kirishima is saved from this awful smell and pun by the door being melted open. Mina walks into the bathroom and gags. It smells like something died in here. Toru whines, but Kirishima isn't able to tell where the noise is coming from. Kirishima hardens and punches Mina in the stomach. You're harder than I remember Mina comments as she shoots acid at him. Can you take this somewhere else? Mirio utters a yelp as acid starts eating away at the bottom of his shoes. Just shut up and keep your legs closed Kirishima replies as he tries to kick Mina's legs out from under her. Mina jumps into a backflip to evade this attack. Kirishima gets hit from behind. Ouch, you're too hard Toru complains as she clutches her right fist. Kirishima slams his elbow back and hits her in the chest. So, you're right there Kirishima thought before spinning 306 static, grabbing Toru along the way and pinning her to the ground. Kirishima blushed once he felt her bare skin against his bare chest. Ouch, you're crushing my chest against the floor, she says while struggling to get him off of her back. Pinning a naked girl to the floor isn't manly. Kirishima thinks to himself as he picks her up and wonders what he is supposed to do. All Might never mentioned what to do if you capture a villain. I guess there's only one thing to do Kirishima sighs as he throws Toru at Mina like a football. Dodge. Toru yells as she flies towards her partner. How? Mina shouts. You can't dodge what you can't see. Mina gets smacked by an invisible force and falls hard on her back. Grunting in pain as weight settles on her stomach. She wonders if she can wave the white flag. Toru gets up moments later and charges towards Kirishima. This is worse than fighting that illusion girl from middle school. Kirishima thinks to himself. As soon as she gets close, she finds his left and right arm hammering her stomach. How did you know? Toru asks with a wince. Lucky guess Kirishima replies. In truth, he did it by looking at Mina's body to figure it out. Toru pushed down on Mina's stomach and chest, making them look dented and abnormal. Kirishima saw these features return to normal and guessed that Toru was charging towards him. He was able to counter by taking a calculated risk. He found her arms reach by remembering the distance between her shoulders and the knuckles of her gloves when she had clothes on. And in the event his hits missed and he got hit instead, he'd learn her real location. Mina shoots acid at the bathroom floor and it quickly eats through the tile and the wood below it until there's a two feet wide hole in the ground. Jump through the hole Toru. Mina yells as she slides back into the fray. Moments later, Toru yells I did it. Alright Mina says before shooting acid at Kirishima forcing him to duck. You missed. Kirishima smirks as the acid flies over his hair. I don't think she did Mirio frantically screamed. What now? Kirishima exclaims before he turns 108 Idig and sees Mirio's plight. Acid is eating away at the floor under Mirio's toilet bowl. A little help would be nice. Mirio screams, playing the part of a scared civilian excellently. Kirishima is tackled to the floor by Mina for his mistake. He took his eyes off her. I won't lose like this Kirishima thinks to himself as he is forced to watch Mirio fall through the floor. I won't lose. Kirishima slams the back of his head into Mina's jaw, creating an audible crack. Sorry Mina. But losing isn't on my agenda Kirishima declares as he forces himself into a standing position despite Mina's best efforts. He starts walking towards the hole, one foot in front of the other. Left foot, then the right. Mina is no longer touching the ground. Kirishima hops into the hole and sees Mirio being dragged towards the door by an invisible force. Kirishima charges forth, sweat glistening on his forehead. Manly head ram he screams as he rams into Toru head first. This sends the four of them into a tumble, limbs tangling together as they fly out the front door, down the steps and onto concrete. Did I forget to mention that Mirio's pants and underwear are still at his ankles? Their panic is halted before it can begin by an alarm sounding and All Might's booming voice Kirishima wins. Good, now get off of me Mirio. Kirishima yells at the people pinning him to the floor. 
Okay, you go Aoyama. How exactly does your quirk work? Izuku asks as they trek towards the replica of Kirishima's chosen house along with Mirio. He wants to have a basic defense plan made before the timer actually starts. Well, my quirk is called Naval Laser, but that is a bit of a misnomer. I can actually emit my laser from other things too. I just prefer to use my stomach because I can't make the circumference of the laser beam exceed its origin. By that I mean if my fingertips are 3 inches horizontally and vertically the lasers cap out at those measurements too. Using my laser for longer than a second also puts strain on my body. Enough strain to collapse my stomach, cave in my chest, break my fingers, hands, arms, etc. I choose option number one because you can live without a fully functional stomach. Yuga explains. You could live with broken hands Mirio chimes in. No you couldn't. You wouldn't be able to open anything with broken hands. Could you imagine a world where jars can never be opened? Yuga asks, aghast at the notion that someone would be okay with that. Let's get back on topic. Why do you only have that device on your stomach? Why not have gloves made with the same tech? Izuku cuts in. He's eager to get back to business. Witty banter later. Plan now. Too expensive. Getting this belt made already cost my parents so much money that they'll die of old age before they can earn enough money to retire. Yuga sighs. It's one of the reasons why he wants to be a hero. He wants to give them back all the money they spent making sure his defective quirk wouldn't kill him early. He wants to be a hero so that they can retire just like they planned to. Izuku silently begins to plan a way to sneak a valuable gem into Yuga's backpack. Okay, how familiar are you with light reflection? Izuku asks, while brainstorming how to tip the scales completely to their side. Quite familiar. I used to turn the whole mirrors into a death trap every time I stretched backwards and accidentally discharged. Yuga replies, put quite a few holes in the wall too. They spend the next two minutes walking in silence. Alright, I have a plan to take down Momo and Kaminari. Izuku states as they reach their destination. His eyes clearly displaying confidence. A look of assured victory. Who do you think will win? Toru asks the class. Momo and Kaminari are fucked back Hugo answers, getting confused looks in return. What do you mean? Momo's and Izuku's quirks are evenly matched, while Yuga isn't that strong. Momo and Kaminari should be more than enough to win. Mizo Shoji questions. Deku has had too much time to prep for this. He knows everyone's quirk and how they use it thanks to the videos of yesterday's pursuit training. That look in his eyes is the same look he used to give his opponents at national chess tournaments before ruthlessly dismantling them. He already has a plan, backup plan and backup backup plan ready. He'll be practically invincible in this match unless something completely random and unpredictable occurs. Katsuki explains. You watched him play chess. I thought you hated each other Achako says. Why would two people who hate each other willingly occupy the same space? We did hate each other, but my mom is friends with his mom, so we would pretend to be best buds whenever they were around. As a result, I was dragged along to witness Izuku completely fucking own his opponents, who were adults by the way and defend his title as Japan's chess champion for the third year in a row. Katsuki replies, Wait, Izuku is the guy that made my brother give up chess forever. Ida is shocked that his brother lost to a 13-year-old. His older brother came home after the national chess tournament's final round two years ago and refused to play it again. He sold his chess set and switched to playing a children's card game called Yu-Gi-Oh. So what exactly is this wall for? Yuga asks while examining the blue crystal around the house. It's there to prevent Kaminari from entering without Momo's quirk. That way our foes are forced to enter from the same side and together. Izuku responded before pulling a green emerald bow and white quartz arrow from his stomach. The weird thing about this arrow is that the arrowhead has been replaced by a small sphere. Okay, so what's with the archery equipment Mirio questions? Nobody uses those anymore, guns exist. I'm about to sit in a window and snipe Momo before she can make some type of laser cannon that is surprisingly non-lethal. Izuku replies before dragging the two of them into the house. He places his hands on opposite walls before speaking. Be quiet, I have to concentrate. He announces before shutting his eyes and retreating to the depths of his mind. He needs to remember the exact details of the house. Every hall, every door, every floor, furniture placements and windows. Every minute detail that he can recall. As he does this, blue sapphire creeps from his hands. It spreads throughout the house, covering the floor and walls alike. Five minutes pass and Izuku drops to his knees with sweat pouring out of his body. This is the final step in securing their victory, if Deku's theory is correct. These crystals are blue, meaning that they reflect blue light, while absorbing all other colors. Yuga's laser is just amplified blue light that sparkles for some reason. This means that some of the beam will be bounced away at another wall, hopefully landing a couple hits on the way. This will continue until there's only regular blue light particles bouncing around and blinding everyone in the house. Okay, so what's next? Yuga asks while Izuku catches his breath. 
Now, we wait for the match dot 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 to start. Izuku answers between breaths. So, how do we win here? Kaminari immediately defers to his partner's superior knowledge. I have no idea. Maybe I could make a giant mirror to reflect Yuga's laser blasts, but I have no idea what to use against Izuku. A sword could work if I take advantage of cleavage and fracture, but I have no way of making sure I don't accidentally cut an arm off. Anything else I can think of is either too blunt to damage him, or it is too much piercing power. Momo tells him, not realizing that she lost him as soon as she started talking about crystals. What's cleavage and fracture? Kaminari asks. Long explanation short. Those are the best ways to break gems without excessive brute force. Momo sighs. Sometimes being the smartest person in the group isn't as fun as TV shows make it look. Having nobody to bounce ideas off of is a definite downside to being too smart in comparison to your teammates. She sighs again before trying to figure out a plan to beat Izuku that Kaminari can understand and execute. There we go dearie. All patched up recovery girl says after kissing Mina's jaw. Kirishima's headbutt had caused Mine's jaw to crack in two places. There's still a light bruise on her chin, but that is supposed to disappear within the week. This doesn't stop Kirishima from flinching whenever he looks at it. Sorry Mina Kirishima cries as soon as recovery girl leaves the room to get their hall passes. His tears begin to flow freely with nobody there to see them except his closest friend. Mina pulls him into a hug and whispers into his ear that everything is fine. No, it isn't. Your jaw got broken and it's all my fault. That isn't manly at all. Kirishima replies, resting his head on her shoulder. You want a two versus one, that's hella manly. Just because you gave me a little bruise doesn't mean you have to cry. This doesn't change how I feel about you Mina whispers before wiping away the tears on his cheeks and looking him in the eyes. Your eyes look beautiful Kirishima says getting a blush from Mina in return. While looking in into her beautiful eyes, Kirishima silently promises to keep her safe. He'll be her shield for as long as he lives. Flattery will get you everywhere Mina smirks as she pulls him into another hug. I am nothing. Nothing but a failure. I failed my parents and my children. The last words of Shoto's mother before being dragged into a mental hospital by Endeavor. XXX30 We find ourselves in the gap between dimensions with a white-haired woman, the same woman from before. In the void, she summons an Izuku from a faraway universe to keep her company for the next hour. This Izuku wields black and white lightning. Good to see you again Izuku exclaims while pulling her into a bone-crushing hug. This isn't the time, people are watching. She says while trying to break out of his grip. They've seen worse, a little hugging is fine. Izuku replies as he runs his fingers through her white locks of hair. Anyways, I'll need a favor soon. One of the Izuku doppelgangers pulled a Todoroki when we weren't looking. She informs him, I can go right now if you want. There's nothing major happening in my world and there's a week-long break from school due to the League of Villains injuring half the class at USJ. Izuku announces, I know, did you forget I'm all-seeing? She sighs, the audience isn't all-knowing. Izuku retorts you haven't shown them my story. Your story is too graphic for most audiences. People wouldn't like it. She replied, I disagree. Magnet Izuku murdered his own dad. Lightning Izuku grumbles. Yeah, and his story got cancelled. Anyways, you can't go there yet. The Izuku is still in class and there's no way for you to get him alone right now. She comments, Wait, Magnet Izuku got booted. So who's going to take his place? Izuku asks, Back when Sand Izuku and Dragon Izuku got booted, Spider Deku and Gem Deku took their place. They don't talk about them anymore. I don't know she shrugs. They would spend a long time just talking to each other, catching up on old times. 70. Izuku decided that sitting in the window was boring. So he decided to climb up the front of the house in order to reach the balcony he sits up there until the match starts. Momo and Denki are running down the street moments after the timer starts. As soon as they turn around a corner to get to the main street, Momo gets sniped by a white arrow from 13 meters away and gets knocked on her butt. Bullseye Izuku thinks as his arrow hits the space between Momo's breasts without piercing skin. He knocks another arrow and waits. If they weren't in the middle of combat right now, Izuku would never be able to focus on Momo's body long enough to aim his bow and arrow. He'd turn into a stuttering mess that could barely say a complete sentence and would talk at a speed of one word per minute. Adrenaline is really a wonderful tool, especially around pretty girls. Get up, we're still in his range. Denki puts Momo's arm over his shoulder and drags her behind a concrete wall. Another arrow curves around the bend and hits Denki in the small of his back. Gah! Denki yells, standing ramrod straight. Judging by the muffled yell, I hit another bullseye. Izuku tells Yuga and Mirio. I couldn't even see them Mirio thinks in awe. If he ever becomes an underground hero, Izuku could incapacitate villains without them knowing he was there at all. Okay, I think I've harassed them enough, Yuga it's your time to shine. Izuku shouts down to his partner before he leaves his perch by jumping down to the balcony, then starts climbing down to Yuga's area. Once he's down, he lets the bow shatter in his hand. I shine brighter than a quasar. 
Taking them down will be facile from while you just start smiling and sparkling. Quit switching between French and English in the middle of a sentence. You've got to pick one and commit. Izuku says while making a crystal yo-yo to play with. What? He gets bored easily. Yuga adamantly refuses to quit abruptly changing the language he uses. Izuku's reply is cut off by the sound of his crystal wall being cut. Izuku rushes to the window and sees a giant yellow laser tearing through the wall. I was joking about the laser of doom Izuku whines. Not realizing that he was basically begging the universe to fuck with him. That wall took a lot of effort to make. Yuga tried to interfere with a laser blast of his own, but the damage was done. There's a human-sized hole burrowed into the wall. Remember the plan Izuku shouts before retreating to the backyard with Mirio. Yuga waits for Kaminari and Momo to enter the building before sprinting down a corridor and making a sharp turn up the steps. Step 1. Divide and conquer. The villains have no idea who has the target with them and there's a time limit, so the only logical solution is to save time is by splitting up to chase both at once. This is where Izuku's plan kicks in. He knows for a fact that he can't fight Momo in a one-on-one. -on -one. At least, not if he wants an assured victory. She's too unpredictable. Nobody except her knows what will pop out of her chest when that pink light appears. It could be anything. A bomb, a railgun. Not even a jet plane with laser guns attached is an object in the realm of impossibility. Hell, she could probably make crystals if she wanted to. Sure, they wouldn't be as versatile as Izuku's, but getting smacked by an oversized diamond is always going to hurt. But Yuga and his limited photokinesis could be her hard counter, if used right. The laser could decimate any weapon that goes airborne and force her to keep her distance at the same time. Yuga just has to make sure he doesn't overexert himself. A laser that lasts too long, or accidentally firing a full laser from a place besides his stomach, and on the off chance he ends up facing Denki instead, it still isn't a problem. Light is faster than electricity after all. Yuga sees Momo's signature ponytail coming up the step and he sighs in relief. The plan is worky. Any excitement was cut down and replaced with fear moments later as he caught a quick flash of blonde hair coming up the steps. Denki came up the steps too. This wasn't part of the plan at all. It was supposed to be a one versus one. Unfortunately for Yuga, Momo was fully intent on using a numbers advantage whenever she could. Sorry Yuga, but I refuse to fight Kaminari. His electricity is too dangerous. My father's quirk might activate as an act of pure self-preservation. Deku mumbles to himself. Mirio hears this and becomes curious. He thought that the crystals was Izuku's only quirk. But it sounds like that isn't the case. Izuku is hiding his full power from his peers. What quirk? Mirio questions as he skids to a stop. None of your business, so butt out Izuku responds. A hero's job is to butt in. Mirio retorts while crossing his arms. Izuku opens his mouth to respond, then closes it before sighing. Have you ever seen that old show about the group of dragon slayers? Izuku asks, getting a nod in return. I can basically do two of their abilities. It lets me eat elements and spit them back out with a much greater force than they had previously. It has the same limitations if the videos of my bastard father are accurate. He couldn't eat the same element he just spat out. Izuku replies, keeping his answer as short as possible. So, why don't you use it? Mirio asks. That quirk would be extremely useful against Kaminari. But Mirio can't help but feel like he knows that quirk from somewhere. It's on the tip of his tongue. I refuse to use the quirk of that deadbeat bastard of a father. I refuse to use the quirk of a monstrous villain who beat his wife and ditched her alongside his quirkless son. Izuku whispers with a quiet fury as those memories resurface. Memories of events that not even the Bakugos were aware of. Months of being forced into a secret closet before that man came home. Curling into a ball while being forced to listen to the pain-filled screams of his mother for hours at a time. Being completely helpless and unable to put an end to it. Every day a new bruise would form on her face. Every day her arms would be zapped by the electricity he spat and her legs would be burned. This way she couldn't fight back or run away from him. She would spend most of the next day in the bathtub. Every day a new reason to hate that man would appear. Sometimes he would pop in without any warning and Izuku would get a beating of his own. They couldn't even say anything to the authorities. He threatened to burn the house down while they were still in it. All they could do was endure it until he got sent to another country by his job. Ironically, Izuku's quirk would activate the day after he left. A quirk with the power to make sure he was never hurt again. A lone tear travels down Izuku's cheek and Mirio decides to drop the subject for now. Momo knew she was in trouble. Once Denki went down due to a sparkly laser, but she didn't expect for the laser to start bouncing off the walls. Oh come on, Momo said, before pressing herself down against the ground to avoid a laser that was getting a little too close to hitting her. Once the laser passed over, she got up and charged towards Yuga in order to enact a crazy plan. Yuga saw this coming and attempted to flee, but his reaction was too slow. Momo grabbed him, pulled him into a full Nelson and twisted around. This put Yuga between her and the incoming laser. Oh the irony Yuga thought before being knocked out by a weakened laser to the gut. 
The laser knocks both of them to the floor, but leaves behind a minor burn on Yuga's chest. Captain Sparkles is down. Now it's time to deal with Diamond Dude Momo thought before leaping over the balcony. Don't you think you should contact him? Mirio asks Izuku while holding onto his shirt. It's been dead silent for the past three minutes. Well, not dead silent the sound of the wind tearing through the city is hard to ignore, especially when that sound is accompanied by the irregular movement of your clothing. Izuku's shirtless state means that he doesn't have to deal with the billowing clothing, something that Mirio is quite envious of right now. No, he's unconscious. That would explain why All Might hasn't ended the exercise yet. Izuku whispers from his crouched down position now be quiet, you're going to give away our position. Too late Momo thinks before leaping from around the corner, a strange and long piece of metal in her dominant hand. A closer look would reveal that it has two strange openings on both sides. I win the bet. She came alone Izuku tells Mirio while standing up and turning to face Momo. Draw your sword Momo tells him. No Izuku responds. Those swords are too lethal and the last thing he wants is to make Momo bleed like Shoto. Never again will he draw a sword on an ally. Fine, but I hope you have a way to block this. Momo clicks a button and two tubes. That pulse and eerie black color shoot out of the holes, forming a staff. Red Amethyst coats Izuku's arms and hands as he charges towards Momo. He tries to uppercut her, but meets nothing but air before finding a tube buried in his stomach. Momo quickly jerks it away to reveal slightly burnt skin and Izuku bends over clutching his stomach. He winces once his mind receives the pain signals that only burnt skin can produce. Shit, that fucking hurts. Izuku yells. It's a good thing that Momo didn't use plasma like they did in the comics and movies. Izuku winces as he unfolds himself. He creates a crystal staff and uses it to block the next blow. This is how the next couple minutes are spent. Blocking and dodging is the only thing Izuku can afford to do. Any attempted at offense results with Izuku acquiring a new burn in return. Izuku, you better take me seriously. Momo spins and uses that speed to try and slam her weapon into Izuku's stomach again. This time, it's stopped by Izuku grabbing onto the tube with a crystal-coated hand. Izuku jerks his hand back while gripping the device, attempting to disarm his beautiful opponent. At the same time he delivers a punch to her solar plexus, weakening her grip just enough for the staff to slide out of her hand. Next, he coats his chest in carnelian and puts his less dominant hand on the makeshift lightsaber. The tables have turned in a 108-idic fashion, to my side, where they shall stay until I beat you Izuku declares before delivering a series of onslaughts to her body by dual wielding the staff. He jumps, he flips, and he twirls, anything to avoid giving her the breathing room to create another lightsaber. Need a distraction Momo thinks as she steps back to dodge a swipe that would hit a little too close to her face. Her hands glow pink and Russian dolls shoot out, littering the field with cute plastic dolls. Izuku jumps back, wary of the objects littering the field. They pop open revealing that all of them have flash bangs inside of them. Her crazy Izuku looks up to see Momo wearing a blindfold and he immediately closes his eyes. 20 seconds after the flashbangs go off, Momo removes her blindfold and charges forward. She drives her fist into his stomach before he can regain his hearing, sight or balance. This time it knocks him out and he falls onto the lightsaber, lightly burning an important part of him in the process. I'm getting tired of seeing you in here. Recovery girl sighs. This is the third time he has been sent to her office. Believe me, I'm tired of being here too Izuku thinks to himself while blinking his eyes. Those flashbangs were too bright and that nut shot was fucking brutal. He could probably heal them if he weren't so hungry, it kills his focus. There has to be a crystal that speeds up physical healing somewhere in his journals. Anyways, the school day is over. It has been for an hour now. Recovery girl tells him. One of Izuku's female classmates brought his backpack and uniform to recovery girl after the exercise ended. Izuku limps out of the nurse's office and makes his way to the subway. Izuku is alone in his house, writing the last couple sentences for Mr. Aizawa's essay when he feels a chill creep down his spine. The air conditioner cut itself on. The desk lamp begins to flicker on and off, along with the ceiling light. The television cuts itself on and off. Meanwhile everything begins to float off the ground. What is going on? Izuku yells as he sprints for the door. They already got rid of the ghost haunting his room. He grabs the doorknob and gets a shock accompanied by a flash of black. His arm locks up, becoming numb in the process, then his shoulders follow suit. Moments later, he falls to the floor like a puppet with its strings cut, no longer able to control his body. This isn't going to end well Izuku thinks before seeing a white flash. You don't look like much. I don't know what makes you special enough for her to waste her last favor on you. Somebody said before Izuku notices that the ceiling is much closer than before. Put me down. Izuku shouts, trying to pierce his room's thick walls and alert one of the neighbors. Oh, you can still talk. I knew I was forgetting something. The stranger puts a hand to Izuku's throat and taps it with an electrified finger. No talking, that's how he likes his kidnappings. They turn into white lightning and vanish into the skyline. 
Izuku's room is left in disarray, his essay laying forgotten and scattered on the floor. Time to smack some sense into you the stranger thinks. Where am I? I think as I wake up, vision blurry, body sweaty, and mouth is dry enough to be considered a desert. I blinks my eyes and my vision gets a little clearer. Clear enough to notice that four people are unconscious in front of me. All women based on their body shape. Their arms are chained to the wall and their legs chained to the floor. Faces covered by bags with a smile crudely drawn on it. I try to move my arms, but can't feel them at all. So, I'm still paralyzed below the neck. That's not good. Are my vocal cords working yet? I should probably test that. Hey, okay talking is an option again. I whisper, my voice has become hoarse. Now, how does that help me escape here? I grumble to myself before being startled by the sound of a door opening followed by metal smacking bricks. The stranger from earlier starts talking good, you're finally awake. Let's play a game. A game of life and death. A game of fear and lies. I if you're going for intimidation. Why you probably should have picked a better villain to study. I tell the stranger. The stutter is back. I thought I fixed that when I started using crystal healing. Wait, where are my crystals? Was I kidnapped because a villain wanted an endless supply of money? Shut up and listen to the rules. The stranger barks I'm going to fire electricity at those unconscious civilians. Your goal is to stop them from being hurt. Let's see what's stronger, your pride or your will to protect. I start to panic. Leave them out of this. This is between me and you. He snorts, close, but not completely true. This is between you and nobody else. And before you drive yourself crazy thinking about my motives, let me tell you this now. My only motive here is to save you. Save you from your delusional viewpoint. Now it's my turn to snort. A murderer trying to play psychiatrist. Yeah, and who are you supposed to be, Dr. Phil? I ask. Though, I prefer to go by my hero name, Contrast. But anyways, let's play the game. Contrast informs me. White lightning blitzes through the air and crashes into one of the unconscious people. As soon as the lightning hits, my ears are blasted by the most horrifying scream I've ever heard. Her body starts to convulse, her shackles smacking against the ground and walls. Skin begins to slowly black before turning to ash. Blood starts to leak out of the openings created by the missing flesh. I try to activate my quirk, but nothing appears. After several minutes, everything stops. No more convulsing. No more noise. The only thing left is a skeleton. Not even a puddle of blood remains. You could have saved her. Now her children will be sent to an orphanage. They'll probably be separated and took to different foster parents too. That's one family torn apart by your prideful inaction. The murderer comments. Tears begin to leak out of my eyes. Oh great, now you're crying. Pathetic. A coward that cries. He yells. I'm not a coward. My quirk wouldn't activate. Tears continue to leak from my eyes at a faster rate. He laughs you could have swallowed the lightning. But you didn't even try to use it. I can't use it. I can't use that monster's power. I can't use that monster's power. Not now, not ever. I scream. Oh, so using the power you were born with makes you a monster and you're afraid of becoming one. Well I have bad news for you. If using a trait passed down by a monster makes you one, then you were screwed from day one. You have your father's freckles and hairstyle on full display. But whatever. You can stand proud next to the bodies. He's openly expressing his anger now. The stranger walks in front of me and I see my own face staring at me with a look of disgust. Life doesn't work like that. You can't be trusted to protect the citizens if you walk around at 50% power. Seeing someone with my face act like this is pissing me off. So, I'm going to leave you with some parting words before I get your disgraceful ass out of my sight. He pauses to calm himself down. When someone gets killed despite you giving it your all, that's not your fault. But the moment you give less than 100% and someone dies, that one's on you. As you are now, the only victory afforded to you when shit hits the fan is that you stuck true to your heart. You were a coward Deku, until your last whimper, my doppelganger says. Okay, that one stings, kicking me where it hurts, while using logic. I can't even stay mad at that. Three more white bolts of lightning shoot past me. I open my mouth and start inhaling. The effect is instant. The lightning reverses directions and shoot towards my mouth. It takes a lot of effort to swallow it. I gagged a couple times. It took even more effort to keep it down. My throat is burning and my tongue feels like I only ate sour candy today. Congratulations, you win the game. I can feel his smugness behind me. Who are you? I ask without thinking. I'm you, but better. He replies. Why are you here? I question. I was sent here to save you by a clairvoyant woman who looks good for her age. She pulled me from my universe in order to do it. He responds. Another universe. I would have a much harder time believing this if I didn't live in a world where any ability from shooting lasers from your eyes to spitting lava is possible. Wait, that means the multiverse theory is true. A world where we're all evil. A world where quirks never existed. Anything is a real possibility. Why couldn't my life stay simple? But wait, so, why did you kill that girl? It's the only part of this story that doesn't make some type of sense. He quickly starts explaining I didn't. 
That was a giant doll that was made way too realistically. All it'd take is adding an AI to it and you'd get a living organism. That sounds like a... Is that a sex doll? I ask bluntly. The tense atmosphere in the room immediately vanishes. It could be, why? Do you already need to start practicing? I start blushing. H hey, don't spin this on me. You're the guy that brought four sex dolls. Do you have a harem back home? I shoot back. Shut up. I'm sending you home. His face is crimson red now. It will take some time, but maybe one day. When I slay my demons forever. I'll be as strong as me, maybe even stronger. Thank you Izuku, I owe you for this. Who knows how many people your words will help me save. I whisper. I don't know either. But I hope it's enough to prepare you for the USJ I think to myself before grabbing Izuku and carrying him back home. I'll clean this place up later. A whole multiverse. Infinite versions of me. I wonder if having an absent father is a universal thing. Or am I just the odd man out? I feel my phone vibrate in my pocket. I wonder why. Mom's in the middle of dealing with the dinner rush and I don't give out my contact info. I also run a special app to block every bill collector's phone call. So, who could be calling me this late at night? Hesitantly, I pull out my phone to see who's trying to contact me. I gaze at my screen in surprise. Why does Momo have my phone number? I contemplate ignoring the call. Then Contrast starts speaking. If you don't accept the call, I will. Our voices are similar enough for her to dismiss any differences as the result of phones being unable to perfectly transmit the sound of human speech. I had almost forgotten that my other self was crashing on the floor of my room. Something about how a warp gate between universes and the void can only be opened once every 12 hours or else you risk doing permanent damage to the barrier between universes. How did you know it was a girl? I ask. It's always a girl. It's been a constant in every other universe I've visited that during the first week of school, Izuku is contacted by a girl from his class outside of school. Most of the times, it's Yuraka. He lazily responds, I wonder who contacted him. I slide my finger across the screen and I hold the phone up to my ear. Hello Izuku her angelic voice is easily heard over all the chatter in the background. Good afternoon M. Momo. I silently curse, if I could still use my crystals, this wouldn't be a problem. But contrasts electricity is scrambling the signals from my crystal quirk. I was quite shocked to find out that there's a section of the brain related to quirk usage. Quirk users who wield multiple quirks have that section divided into pieces to match the number of quirks. I still have 30 minutes left before my brain can send the signals my body needs to start producing crystals again. Are you busy right now? She asks, and my heart stops momentarily. Is she about to ask me out? No, I lie as I look down at Mr. Aizawa's essay. I still need to finish the last paragraph, but I can't focus on it anymore. The events of today have given me a major case of writer's block. I can hear a sigh of relief through the phone. My parents are forcing me to go to a gala with them. It's a charity event mixed with an award ceremony. She states, I'll let me guess. They want you to bring a date too. I respond, you're correct. This isn't the type of event you go to without one. At least, you wouldn't want to come alone unless you want to be flirted with at every opportunity. Walking down the red carpet in somebody else's arms is the only way to mitigate the number of young people trying to get to know you better. She answers, Okay, I can deal with this. It's not an actual date. I'm just helping her enjoy the evening at a place she doesn't want to be. What do I need to wear? I question. My closet is full of stuff I can wear to a fancy event. This isn't the first one I've been to. Being rich comes with a lot of disadvantages sometimes. Now, I just need to know if I have the right colors. Something that looks nice, but won't stop you from dancing when needed. The colors we're wearing are royal blue and black. Momo replies immediately. Is royal blue the main color? I ask. I might have something if it is. Yes, I have a royal blue tuxedo sitting in the back of my closet. I never thought I'd get a chance to wear it though. I comment. The limo will be there to pick you up in an hour. Momo informs me. Thanks a lot Izuku, I owe you one. She says before hanging up. An hour, that means I'll have time to shower, brush my teeth and get dressed. And I'd still have 25 minutes to kill. Looks like somebody is already going on their first date. I'm so proud contrast comments from behind me. Not a date I assert. Sure, you're just going to a fancy event in a suit because Momo asked you to come with her. He teases. Maybe there weren't any other options. As far as we know she only talks to two guys and our other female classmate. I speculate. It'd make sense. Going with a girl would have the opposite effect. Instead of telling guys to back off it'd make them even more interested in them. Why not choose Shoto? We both know that he has the intimidation factor that comes with being related to Endeavor. The other me is really enjoying playing the role of devil on the shoulder. Not only would that spark a whole lot more celebrity gossip due to Endeavor being a famous hero, but we also know that Shoto has issues with social cues. Picking us was the safer option. I try to explain the logic to him, but that smirk never leaves his face. I'm arguing with myself, isn't this what insane people do? Is this what insanity feels like? I unlock my phone and send my mom a quick text. 
Don't wait up, I'm going out with friends. I added the S so that she wouldn't automatically think I'm on a date. I quickly take care of my personal hygiene. Once I finish brushing my teeth, I consider doing something with my hair. Nah, my hair is perfect exactly how it is. There's nothing wrong with the bush. I leave the bathroom and see Contrast digging through my closet. He pulls out a royal blue outfit and holds it up next to me. He hums, this is going to be a tighter fit than we thought. It'll be impossible for you to hide your muscles from the other guests. Dancing should still be possible though. That's fine, I nod to myself. This will work. With the help of my alternate self, I'm in my suit with 30 minutes to spare. Tying the black tie is much simpler, over and under. Then over, under and through the loop. Pull tight and make sure it lines up perfectly. We make this suit look good, but it feels like you're missing something. Contrast speaks after a moment of silence. My shoes still need to be put on I deadpan. Is this guy sure that he's me? There's no way I'd miss a big detail like that. Oh yeah. I sit there talking to him for the rest of the allotted time. Staying quiet would just make me overthink things. I might even browbeat myself into staying home. I hear the sound of a car horn outside. Time for me to go. Go get her man, show her that Midoriya charm. Contrasts calls out as I make my way to the door. You got this Izuku. This isn't your first gala. Just walk in, smile for the cameras and act as courteous as possible. A little voice in the back of my head chimes in. What are you going to do when you meet her parents? What if they don't like you? Shut up. Are you trying to make me more nervous? Will Momo hate you if you mess up? Stop talking, you'll drive me crazy. This entire conversation is damning evidence that you already are. The men in the white coats should be here any minute. Am I off my meds? I don't remember having to take meds, but I feel like I take meds and I didn't. Let's recap. I was kidnapped by an alternate version of me not even six hours ago. Forced to watch a girl die. Forced to use the forbidden power. Came home with my kidnapper in tow. Then I got bullied by him into accepting a phone call from Momo. I still have no idea why she has my number. After accepting the call, Momo invited me to a gala with her and her parents. Now I'm in the middle of a limo ride with her and her parents. Her dad has been silently staring at me while Momo's mom has successfully dragged me into two situations that led me to accidentally compliment the mother-daughter duo. They do look beautiful, but I did not plan to say it out loud. Moral of the story. This is all Contrast's fault and I will shove a crystal spike where the sun doesn't shine. So, what exactly is your quirk? Momo's mom asks me. I think her name was Momoka. My first one is similar to your family's creation quirk, but it's limited to only making crystals constructs. Now is as good a time as any for my full power to become known. The first one. So you have multiple quirks? Momoka questions, a strange gleam in her onyx eyes. Yes, my second quirk allows me to swallow elements and spit them back out with more power than they started with. I inform her before asking a question of my own. Can you create crystals as well? No, unfortunately the Yeirazu family hasn't had a chance to bring a crystal creation quirk into our family DNA. The creation quirk you see today is the result of intentionally, and sometimes unintentionally, reproducing with creation quirk users. She answers, giving more details than I expected. Quirk science still boggles my mind with how it can be manipulated to create specific things. It's speculated that if you mix enough fire quirks together over multiple generations, you could hypothetically recreate the source quirk, allowing you to use flame and heat manipulation to its fullest extent. You never told me you had another quirk Momo whispers into my ear, and not even my own mother knows I have two quirks. You and Shoto are the only people in class I've trusted with this secret. Everyone else will find out soon. I just figured you'd like to hear it separately. I shrug. That is true. How does that second quirk work in conjunction with the crystal quirk? She asks, curiosity on full display. I'm, I'm not sure. Certain elements can probably be used as a substitute for calories, but I've never tested it. I decide to keep the entire truth secret. Now isn't the time for a depressing flashback. Our conversation is cut short by the sound of her dad clearing his throat. We've arrived. Remember how we're supposed to enter. I can tell that the last part is directed towards me. The chauffeur opens up the door on Momoka's side and helps her out, making sure that the thigh-high slit in her dress doesn't cause a wardrobe malfunction. They proceed to walk down the red carpet. During this time alone with Momo, I decide to create the necklace me in contrast decided on while I was showering earlier. A few moments later a necklace made of sapphire with a lapis lazuli gem attached appears in his hands. HH here you go Momo. Momo's cheeks start to turn pink and I get a tiny ego boost. TT thank you Izuku. She shifts her body so that I can put it on her. Her body brushes against mine as she turns. I put the necklace around her neck, doing my best to avoid messing up her hair which is straightened out and stretches down to her back. I finish just in time for the door to open. Showtime Izuku, put on your best mask and smile for the cameras. Make sure you don't make a fool out of yourself. Who knows how many pro heroes will appear here or watch this. Now is the time to make a good impression for the public. 
That voice is back. Great. Nice to see you again. Yeah, I need to get back on those meds that don't exist. As we step out of the limo, I take the time to notice that there are a lot of news stations covering this event. JBC, Kitsune 4 News and dozens of freelance journalists. Stick to the script. I wrap my left arm around Momo's waist and pull her close. She starts to blush and I get the feeling that my face is redder than hers. I flash a smile towards the cameras as several journalists rush over to interview us. Who's your guest? Momo answers immediately. This is Izuku Midoriya, a fellow student at UA. Are you two on a date? Yes. This answer makes my heart skip a beat and my chest starts to feel funny. It's a good thing that I don't have to speak. Who are you wearing? I can't help but be amazed by Momo. She manages to answer every question shot her way without losing her cool. Before I know it we're sitting at a table with her parents. That was fun Momoka comments. I'm willing to bet that she's enjoying this more than her husband. He looks like he's exhausted. I hate these events so much, I swear. If I wasn't nominated for an award I would drop off a donation and drive off immediately afterwards. He groans. Mr. Yayarazu we'd like to interview you a newswoman from the JBC says. I see him whisper something before his mask returns in the form of a small smile. I'd feel bad for him if he didn't insist on bringing me along to this one. Momo comments after he walks away. I need to go make sure the stage is set up for our guest performer. Momoka says before sauntering away. It's just me and Momo now. So, who's the guest performer? I ask. Some Canadian guy. I forgot his first name, but his last name is Men's. She replies. It's been eating at me for the past hour. Why did you choose me? I blurt out. I barely know anything about you. So I decided to fix that Momo answers with a small smile. Okay, I can deal with innocent curiosity. Now I can focus on other things. Things like, how do you have my phone number and how did you know where I lived? She starts giggling. Your password was a LLMIGHT and I had our butler trace the phone call. I thought his job was to buttle. Not play hacker I respond. Note to self, change every password to A11M1GHT. Music starts to play and I look at the stage to see the singer. I wonder what his quirk is. Research for later, now it's time to dance. I see other guys escorting their dates to the dance floor. May I have this dance, Lady Yayurazu? I ask. You may, but don't call me Lady Yayurazu again. It makes me feel weird she agrees, her blush reappearing. I gently grab her outstretched hand and lead her to the floor. We danced until the awards ceremony portion of this event started. Momo's dad ended up losing the inventor's award to the CEO of Hatsum Industries. But on the bright side, Momoka won the Rescue Hero Award, an award given to the most popular rescue hero. This is determined by a panel of randomly selected judges. I had fun tonight Momo. I needed this I tell her this on the way to the limo. Me too, you're a good dancer. Not a bad conversationalist either. She replies. When we get in the limo, Momo immediately falls asleep. I decide to let her use my shoulder as a pillow. What are your intentions with my daughter? Momo's father asks calmly. He saw the way they seemed to instantly sync their movements together during the dance. I don't have any intentions with your daughter. I'm not looking for a girlfriend if that's what you're worried about. Anyways, I'll be a non-issue soon enough. I doubt she'll want anything to do with me once she learns who my father is. I reply. The rest of the ride to my house is quiet. Who is your father? Momoka asks as we pull up in front of the house. Are you familiar with the guzzler? I question. This will determine how much exposition I need to give. Yeah, he's a villain that plagued Japan and America for six years before being put behind bars by the combined efforts of All Might, Endeavor and Black Tornado. Why? Momoka asks. He escaped three weeks ago, and he's mine. Father, I reveal before opening the door and climbing out in a hurry. Momo won't care. Momoka shouts as I close the door behind me. Even if she doesn't cut me off, I can't afford to let her in until I know she's safe, until I know he's behind bars for good. I walk into the house and I notice that nobody else is home. I guess contrast left while I was gone. Stepping into my room, I cut the light on to see my essay in a neat stack with a note attached to the front page. Hey Izuku, I figured that you deserved a break after the trials I put you through. So, I finished the essay for you. Our handwriting is identical, so eraser head won't know you've had help from anyone. Even then, I'm you, you didn't get someone else's help. Loopholes for the win. Sincerely, Izuku Midoriya. Izuku Pov. I just wanted to sleep. Was that too much to ask for? Apparently the universe said yes because I woke up three hours after I closed my eyes. I can't really remember what my dream was about either. Yes you can, you're just repressing it. Oh great, the voice is back. Is this the price of craziness? A voice in the back of your head that refuses to leave. Go away I mutter as I roll over and bury my face into my pillows. What do you expect me to do? Just move out. I'd prefer it if you did. Too bad. I'm here for as long as you need me to be. I don't need you right now. I need my five hours of sleep. Please shut up and let me sleep. Why would I stop now that I have the attention I've sought for six years? Screw this I'm going back to bed. This mental breakdown can wait until my brain is fully functional. 
We can't wait that long. You have to. Be a OP. Did you just pretend to hang up on me? No, you can lie to your mother, but you can't deceive yourself. Nice try dumb dumb. Did you just call me dumb? I'm a lot of things, but dumb isn't one of them. I know dumb dumb, but we're prideful to a fault. I can push your buttons as much as I want. I'm crazy, this confirms it. It's either that or a deity has too much time on their hands. A Chu the white-haired deity sneezes while manipulating the Gem Deku universe. She's trying to make sure Izumomo becomes a thing. She wants her OTP, damn it. Izuku needs to stop being a prideful, stubborn bastard. It's too bad she can't manipulate personalities. She's only allowed to affect the world around these people. I'm not leaving, you can't make me shut up either. I decide to start singing the Barney theme song in my head. Once that song ends, I repeat it but this time I mentally scream the song. I stand corrected. He didn't come back that night. I woke up to the smell of pancakes and sausage. That means that mom doesn't have work today. I wish I didn't have to go to school today. Mom and I don't get to talk as much as we used to. It's honestly kind of upsetting. Mom spends most of her time working even though she doesn't need to. I don't understand why she works. I can cover our financial needs. Good morning. Go to hell I mutter as I sit up. You can't go somewhere that doesn't exist. I will find you and I will kill you. You aren't allowed to make that reference. I'm tired of this voice already. Can I give it to somebody else? I'm sure Shoto wouldn't mind having a voice in the back of his head. Or maybe I can give him to Bakugo. That'd be an interesting mental breakdown. I could sell tickets. I walk out of the room and make a beeline for the kitchen. American breakfast day is my favorite day of the week. Once a week every week, my mom would cook an American meal favored by an American pro hero. She had started doing this once my quirk activated. This had the benefit of helping me train. Needing a lot of calories to activate my quirk means I have to eat a heavy breakfast. And who consumes more calories than the typical American teen? It doesn't help that my hero research led me outside of Japan's culture, kicking my desire to learn into overdrive. Now, I'm familiar with most American meals and snacks. One day, I'll try every food in existence. I help my mom set the table before taking a closer look at breakfast. Six stacks of chocolate chip pancakes, a bowl full of boiled eggs, and two plates full of sausage patties and sausage links. I immediately swoop two stacks of pancakes onto my plate and start shoveling them into my mouth. How was your date? I immediately start choking on my pancakes. What gave it away? The news channels, you dumbass. You were live on national television. Damn it, I forgot about that. Dum dum the voice says in a sing-song voice. Killing you will make me happier than it should. I'm brought back to reality by my mother snapping her fingers in front of my face. I spit up the half-chewed bowl of pancake and wipe the spit off my mouth. Hopefully my near-death experience will draw attention away from my red face. It was fine trying to act oblivious would be a futile effort. Might as well get the inevitable outcome out of the way. My baby boy is growing up she says before enough water to cause a flood leaves her eyes. If I didn't know any better I'd think we had an eye-based water quirk sitting in our DNA somewhere. But that's highly unlikely. Our family is full of different telekinesis quirks and quirkless people. My grandma could only lift things with her mind. And her mom could lift, push, and pull. And her mom could do all that plus make objects bend and spin. My granddad's branch of the family is hazy, but I'd bet my hidden pocky supply that they had earth-based quirks. He was abandoned and dropped in my maternal great-grandma's orphanage as a kid because his parents thought he was quirkless. He didn't figure out that he could make and manipulate crystals until he was a college graduate with a degree in geoscience and gemology. He decided to start a tradition. He wanted to make sure all of his descendants would have a decent understanding of a single crystal as a little kid, just in case his quirk resurfaced later. My mom learned about the sapphire. And I learned about the red ruby. This might make me sound heartless, but I'm glad he was abandoned. If he had figured out his quirk earlier, what are the odds that he would have met my grandma at the orphanage and married her? And if he became a hero, the Yeyorazu family would have tried to swoop his quirk into their family. That would be a crazy what if scenario. Imagine me being related to Momo. That'd be crazy. I want to meet Momo. My mother says abruptly. I agree immediately. It's Momo's turn to get the overprotective parent treatment. The last time I brought a girl home, mom traumatized her and she refused to ever come back to the house. My phone starts to violently shake in my pocket. What is it this time? I slide the phone out of my pocket and read the news article that popped up in my notification bar. Villain attack leaves upper Musutafu powerless. Apparently, Blackout escaped prison again. This time he absorbed all of the electricity in upper Musutafu and blew up the power plants in the process. Wait, Yue, is in upper Musutafu. A man with light blue hair and a disembodied hand on his face smirks at the television screen. He begins to laugh maniacally operation, blackout was a success. The UA barrier is powerless now. A man made of black mist enters the room, shall we initiate phase 2? Yes, begin operation, symbol smasher. The other man replies as his smirk widens into a full villainous smile. 
Is this the best way to spend our free day? Izuku questions Momo as they enter a game shop that sells Yu-Gi-Oh cards and has an arena for dueling. As far as Izuku knows, it's only going to be him, Momo, Mina and Kirishima. If I'm here, you don't get to stay home either Momo replies. He could have lied about knowing how to play or having a deck. Izuku whispers back. He didn't plan on telling them what deck he plays. But that's unavoidable now. Izuku silently curses out the inventor of the dual disc. They're the only reason Yu-Gi-Oh is so mainstream now. The holographic monsters and attacks made the game an interesting spectacle that captured the entire world's attention. If quirks weren't a thing, the world would probably solve all of its issues with a children's card game. In modern times, pro duelists are paid as much as football players. I didn't think it would lead to Mina suggesting that we all have a duel. Momo replies. It was probably Kirishima's idea and Mina just has more people's contact info Izuku comments. Izuku decides that now is a good time to warn her. I should tell you now, I grew up watching these shows and real life duels. So if I start acting like I'm actually in the show, don't be too surprised. I'll try to suppress my laughter. Momo smiles. It's good to see that Izuku is willing to open up to their peers. He's only spoken to like three people. She's not even sure Izuku knows the names of their classmates. They're almost immediately found by Mina as soon as they enter the back half of the store. They're late. We've been waiting forever. Kaminari whispers into Kirishima's ear. It's only been five minutes. She had her morning frappuccino today. She'll be like this for the next hour or two. Kirishima whispers back. Mina loves sweet things way too much. They're just lucky she didn't have her chocolate-filled chocolate donut as well. Izuku isn't sure if he should use one of his hero decks, Crystal Beast decks or Gem Knight's deck. Yes, Izuku is aware that him using crystal-based cards and hero cards is something to laugh about, but he doesn't care. You picked a store that didn't show up on Google Maps and I'm never in this part of the city, Momo replies before pulling a metal container out of her pocket. Her deck lies within it. Each card is in perfect condition. There isn't a single scratch, smudge or crease on a single one of them. This is something that Momo takes great pride in. Anyways take a look at this, Mina says before shoving a card into the air. Holy shit, it's a winged Kiribo. We should all run away and scream, for we have surely lost. Izuku yells. Mina pulls the card out of the air and looks at it with an incredulous expression. This isn't it. She starts digging into a pile of cards sitting next to a stack of booster pack wrappers. I meant this one. Behold it. Mina yells. Oh no, it's Junkiribo. We should all run away and scream like babies, for we have surely lost this match Izuku screams. I swear I just had it Mina whines before reaching into the pile again and pulling out a new card. Oh no, it's Linkiribo. We should all run away and panic, for we have surely lost this duel. We can't handle that type of firepower Izuku shouts. Fuck it, you'll see in our duel Mina throws her hands into the air. A black portal opens up in an alleyway two blocks away from UA. The blue-haired man from before steps out in a gray hoodie alongside a blonde man with pale skin and silver eyes. He also has an oversized chameleon sitting across his shoulders. Do you understand your mission? The blue-haired man asks. Yes Tamura, my memory isn't that bad. The walls around UA. High school are no longer quirkproof thanks to blackout in operation, blackout. This means you'll be able to disintegrate part of the wall. Allowing Carmela to be snuck onto the campus, in the process. Once it's in, I'll transfer my mind into it. From there, I'll seek out the file containing class schedules and gather any additional information I can acquire without jeopardizing the completion of Objective 1. Once I have the information you seek, I'm supposed to spit out the special capsule containing a portion of Kirijiri's mist. That mist will form a temporary gate leading the chameleon back to Kirijiri at the bar. After that, I'll be paid the other half of what I'm owed and we'll go our separate ways until you require my services again the man answers in a bored tone. Good, I didn't have to repeat myself. Let's begin the stealth segment of our game. Tamura states as they walk out of the alleyway. The trip to UA is done in silence. Neither of the villains are any good at making normal person small talk. Rants about hero society and its flaws would just attract unwanted attention. The duo reaches the back of UA. In no time, Tamura crouches down, places four fingers and a thumb on the bottom of the wall. The paint coating that part of the wall disintegrates immediately, revealing the metal hidden underneath. The metal begins to turn gray, before slowly crumbling into dust. It doesn't want to go, but it must. Three minutes later, the hole expands to the size of a beach ball. Upon closer inspection, Shigaraki sees that the wall is stuffed full of wires. Let's go Carmela the other man says before staring the chameleon in the eyes. His eyes of silver start glowing brighter and the chameleon's eyes change to a dull silver. The man slumps against the wall and Carmela jumps off his back. The mind-controlled chameleon enters the hole and Tamura starts to chuckle. This is almost too easy. Tamura picks up the unconscious man and puts him on his back. Using one hand, Tamura fishes a capsule out of his pocket before letting his quirk disintegrate it. Tamura vanishes in a flash of black with his partner in tow. 
The Todoroki family, Sans Toya and Endeavor, has assembled in the basement of their household. Endeavor was called away to track down Blackout, while Toya is at work in a different city entirely. Is this really the best use of our powers? Shoto asks while looking at the ice rink he, Natsuo and Fayumi created in their basement. Yes, Endeavor is gone. That means we can finally teach you how to have fun. Fayumi replies before handing him a pair of ice skates. She chose to teach at a school close to UA. High school, so she's at home due to the blackout. Endeavor dropped his guard. He probably thinks that him keeping baby bro isolated from us for his entire life would make Shoto isolate us even when he isn't around to play warden. But he's underestimating the strength of our familial bonds Natsuo comments. He chose a college close to UA. High school, so his college is closed due to the blackout as well. Very well Shoto says as he takes the pair of ice skates from Fayumi's hand. A small smile gracing his lips. Ten feet below a forest lies a special prison. This prison is built to hold men, women and children with quirks that allow them to make the air around them become a deadly weapon. This depth was chosen because it limits the amount of space and air the inmates will have access to. It also has the benefit of discouraging them from trying to make a tornado or fly. The most dangerous wind quirks are stored in here. Stored in a place that only the government and a select few men are privy to know the location. A place that is always unbearably hot and dry for the inmates. Only the inmates. The guards sleep in a room with state-of-the-art tech for temperature and humidity regulation. Their uniforms are also equipped with a thermal scanner linked to the tech that keeps their body temperature at a constant number. The wearer is never too hot or too cold. Each cell is customized for a citizen at birth. Every time a child registers their quirk as something wind-related, a cell is built with them in mind, just in case that person becomes a villain in the future. I'll let you in on another secret. There's a prison like this for all the elements. Dangerous earth quirk users have a prison suspended off the side of a mountain, where they have no chance of escaping alive. Unexpected major seismic activity will make the entire three-story prison plunge into the ocean below. Water quirk users are held in a prison surrounded by lava, as far from the oceans as possible, and water is given to them in the smallest quantities humanely possible. Fire, combustion, explosive quirk users who are considered too dangerous are sent to the boiling rock. A prison situated far off the coast of Japan in the middle of a volcanic island and surrounded by boiling hot water. The only way to escape is by flight or gondola. Dangerous lightning quirk users are given cells made of superconductive metals. One spark and everyone is getting zapped. Villains that are blessed with immunity to electric-based attacks are grounded with metal rod implants and wires. Villains with light quirks are locked in cells full of mirrors. Darkness quirks get you locked in a cell full of high-power flashlights. All of these prisons are meant to contain and rehabilitate villains. But there are two places that have a different objective. Two places with names from Greek mythology, Elysium and Tartarus. Vigilantes are sent to Elysium if they become too famous. Then the vigilante is given a choice, live there forever or become an official hero with a very short leash. Elysium is less of a prison and more of a hidden mini-town where you can never leave or talk to anyone on the outside. Villains are sent to Tartarus if they become a threat to the entire country. This place is basically secret death row because Tartarus's security will mow them down as soon as they do anything that the government can spin into a story of attempted escape. Care to guess where Izuku's father was put? A man made of black mist is sitting in the back of a bar when his phone starts to vibrate in his pocket. He hastily pulls out the phone and answers it before the second vibration. The guy calling him is not the type of guy you keep waiting. Have you located the target? A cold voice asks. Yes, he's at the secret air quirk prison. I have the coordinates memorized the mist man replies. Excellent Kirajiri. I knew there was a reason I kept you alive all these years. The man praises while somehow maintaining his emotionless tone. But Kirajiri is smart enough, wise enough to hear the hidden threat, fail and I will end you. Killing him would be a mercy. The man on the other end of the phone has enough dirt on him to make sure he never sees the outside of Tartarus. The man behind the phone is keeping the Japanese government off his back. Their relationship is a curse and a blessing for Kirajiri. He's protected from all the repercussions of his crimes. But not only can he never afford to fail, but he also has to commit crimes more heinous than he would ever do back during his solo days as an information broker and smuggler. Past and future crimes are being held over his head like they're a guillotine and he's King Louis XVI. Thank you, sir. I'll extract the target immediately. Kirajiri responded before the man on the other end of the phone hangs up. Kirajiri focuses on the coordinates in his mind and vanishes into his warp gate. Kirajiri reappears next to a tree. To the average hiker, this is just an average tree. They'll walk past it and be none the wiser. They might even piss on it if they get desperate enough. But this tree isn't an average tree it's a special tree. For you see, one of these branches can be pulled downwards. Once it's pulled, a hatch will open nearby. A hatch that leads to the super-secret air prison's secret entrance. Now, which branch did that guard pull? 
Kirijiri asks himself before fishing his phone out of his pocket. There's a video of two guards escorting a new recruit into the facility. The video reveals that one guard climbed up the tree and pulled the highest branch. I better not get any leaves in my warp gate Kirijiri sighs as he warps next to the fake tree branch. Kirijiri reaches over to grab the branch and notices that the wood feels cold and metallic but still somehow looks exactly like a piece of wood. They have camouflage technology. He yanks the branch downwards and the sound of turning gears fills the forest. The ground begins to shake as a section of the ground lifts up and splits apart, revealing a gold handle connected to a silver trap door. I'm selling that Kirijiri thinks as he pulls the hatch open and yanks the handle off. The gold handle vanishes into his warp gate and reappears under his pillow. Now that the hatch is open, Kirijiri can see that there is a metal tube wide enough for one person. Jeronimo. Kirijiri thought before leaping down the hole. He shoots out of the hole and crashes into an unlucky guard, slamming him into the wall. He landed in the security monitor room. The guard scrambles to his feet and pulls out a gun. Who are you? Kirijiri warps behind him and snaps his neck before responding. The doctor. Damn it. What's the point of making references if nobody is alive to hear them when I say them? Kirijiri mutters as he grabs the gun, idly recognizing it as a desert eagle and ammo from the guard. He also steals his ID card and wallet. Strutting over to the camera monitors while admiring the silver and pink gun in his hand, Kirijiri starts smiling. He sits in the chair and starts looking at the screens, searching for his target cell. This will make his job so much easier because his quirk lets him warp to any location that he has seen or has coordinates for. The second method is usually less precise. Minutes pass by before Kirijiri finds the cell he's looking for. There you are, Hisashi Midoriya. There are two guards outside his cell. One has a head that glows and the other has a translucent torso. Kirijiri opens up a warp gate and shoots his gun into it. The two guards drop to the floor with a hole in their brains. He follows this by breaking all of the screens with his gun and shooting the alarm system. The sound of footsteps rushing through the hall forces Kirijiri to move fast. He warps in front of the cell and shows the cell scanner the stolen ID card. The door slides open and the lights cut on, revealing what's inside. Before Kirijiri can enter the room and extract Hisashi, a fireball grazes the edge of his mist. Kirijiri turns to face his attacker and holds the gun up to his head, stop or I'll shoot. The guard hesitantly extinguished the flames coating her elbows. She's baffled by the suicide threat and is unsure how to proceed. Don't pull the trigger, you have people that care about you. She tries to placate him, unknowingly striking a very painful chord. Not anymore Kirijiri whispers before pulling the trigger. Bang. The woman drops to the floor with a hole in her heart, blood oozing onto the floor that's covered in white tiles. Kirijiri walks up to the dying woman and pulls the trigger again, aiming for the head this time. Bang. Blood splatters onto the floor and begins to form another blood pool. Bang. More blood and tiny pieces of brain start to splatter against the wall. Bang. Bang. Bone shard starts to leak out with the blood. Bang. 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 By this point the face is a bloody mess that's mutilated beyond recognition. Kirijiri takes a deep breath and walks away. He starts heading towards Hisashi's cell to finish his mission. He enters the room and immediately notices the lack of a bed or toilet. He also sees a table in the center of the cell. There is a man strapped to a table with metal restraints. There's two surgical blades stabbed in his chest, exactly where his lungs should be. He's on some type of life support system. Kirijiri can see the machine drawing his blood and making sure it undergoes oxygenation. They punctured your lungs to make sure you couldn't use the air in your lungs for your quirk. The lengths that people go to make sure that they feel safe astounds me. Kirijiri sighs before blanketing the entire room with his mist. The boss won't be happy about this. Hisashi made a quick recovery after getting his lungs patched up. He isn't at full power anymore, but he is able to do small jobs now. Kirijiri is sitting in his bar with his phone pressed against his ear. Everything is going according to plan. A cold voice responds good. I trust that Hisashi is recovered enough to join this war as well. He's recovered enough to beat up a bunch of toddlers in spandex. Kirijiri confirms after a brief moment of hesitation. He won't be able to go head-to-head -head with All Might again, but he can definitely fight the students. The only foreseeable problem is Izuku Midoriya. Power was restored to the school and classes would be held the next morning, but Izuku couldn't sleep. Every time he would enter dreamland he would wake up sweating an hour later with no memory of what he dreamed about. I'm tired of this I mutter as I wake up covered in sweat, sitting up. I can't help but notice that most of the bed sheet is drenched in sweat. This is the fourth sheet tonight. What's wrong Zuzu? Can't sleep. Go away. Let me suffer in silence. I groan as I look at the time on my alarm clock. 12.30 am. This is going to be a long night. Maybe I should just start taking sleeping pills. Screw the long-term consequences. Anything is better than what I'm dealing with now. Ever since I read about Hisashi escaping his cell, I haven't been able to get a decent amount of sleep. 
scared that he'll come back to finish what he started. As these words are spoken or thought, I'm not sure anymore. I touch the scar on the upper part of the back of my left thigh. It's starting to fade away, but I remember exactly where it starts and ends, and I always will. The scar is three inches wide at the thigh and stretches all the way to my right shoulder. It isn't a straight line, there are several loops. It honestly looks like he tried to carve a symbol into my back. And now that monster is roaming the alleyways, waiting for an opportunity. An opportunity to finish you. Shut up. I hiss as I reach for the TV remote. Maybe some late night anime will help me ignore that voice in the back of my head. Ignoring me won't solve anything. Soon enough there will be voices on the outside that tell you the truths you don't like to hear. Will you ignore the crowd too? I'll do my damnedest. Sleep evaded me for the rest of the night, leaving me in a grumpy mood. This wasn't helped by the usual subway issues. Occupants who brought babies on board. Occupants that don't know what soap is and occupants that don't know when to shut up. After escaping from that hellish area, I walk up to UA and see a sight that makes my blood boil. Desperate reporters trying to make a quick buck. In our world of heroes, they're the worst type of reporter. Always hunting for the next story that will attract the most attention, spread controversy and get them a lot of money. Never drawing attention to the things that need to be talked about. No, we don't need to know who our celebrities are beefing with. No, we don't need to know that this celebrity couple has a baby. Why should we care about them naming them something weird? Same goes for hero couples. I'm talking about you supernova. The world doesn't need to know that All Might is a teacher at UA. None of these things are what you should be broadcasting. What about the quirkless people in a world where most paying jobs are built around quirks? People should know that the quirkless make up most of the world's unemployment rate. They should know that quirkless people are barely getting by in life. In most cities, quirkless people who make it to adulthood have no choice but to take seedy jobs or work in the fast food industry. What about all of the quirkless children in orphanages? I bet people would feel really bad if they realized that 90% of the children in orphanages are quirkless. What about all of the quirkless civilians who are being abused by quirk users behind closed doors? Their plight is being ignored in favor of useless drivel. Let's go back to speaking about children. It's speculated that a third of quirkless children in our generation won't make it to adulthood. That's the real reason that the quirkless population is decreasing. Most of them get murdered by someone with a quirk, die from malnutrition in a poorly funded orphanage, or they commit suicide in high school. What about all of the quirkless civilians who are being abused by quirk users behind closed doors? Their plight is being ignored in favor of useless drivel. People are ignorant. I would be ignorant of this too, if I hadn't experienced a fraction of what quirkless children go through at the hands of someone who is supposed to love them. I quell the rage bubbling up inside my gut and push my way through the crowd. Subconsciously, I block out their voices as they turn towards me. They probably just want to ask me questions about All Might. And anyone who doesn't probably wants to ask me about the gala I went to with Momo. You could just send them away with your bad breath. The voice cuts in. Seriously? What is this voice? It insults me whenever it feels like. It cracks poorly timed jokes and it begins conversations without me doing or saying anything. Maybe I'm your conscience. Maybe I'm the voice of your repressed thoughts. Maybe your quirks hold the answer. Or maybe you're just batshit insane. Or, I block out the rest of his spiel as I manage to get behind the UA barrier and make a beeline for the entrance. My rage isn't gone. It's simmering below the surface, just waiting for a way out. I trudge into class five minutes early. On the outside, I look fine, but when the inside, I feel like I didn't sleep at all last night. Finding Shoto is easy, look for the warmest part of the room. As soon as I found him, I collapsed into the chair next to him. You good? Shoto asks with a monotone voice. I'm starting to wonder if he practices that voice every morning, because I swear he can keep using that voice forever until something outlandish happens. Not really, sleeping is hard I manage to utter before I start yawning. Just take sleeping pills, my sister does it and she's fine. Something about Shoto seems different now. He still has his cold exterior, but now that I'm looking at him a little harder, his eyes seem to be less dull and there's something behind them. It feels like determination, but determination to do what? Take the pill and you'll be a coward forever. I really need to find out why this voice is in my head, and why it sounds like me. The sound of a chair scraping against the floor next to us ends our conversation. Hey Momo I greet her with fake cheer in my voice. She doesn't need to know that I'm not sleeping well. Take a look at this. A phone is propped up in front of my eyes. There's a news article on the screen. The Guzzler returns. Earlier today the Guzzler was sighted breaking into Yayazaru Inc. and Hatsum Industries. Oh no I whisper in shock. Below the article there's a picture of the man who did it. That's not all. People online are connecting dots as well Momo states before swiping the screen. People have taken the images from the gala and superimposed my body next to his. The title of the page is very concerning. Villain hiding at UA. This is very bad. The truth of my heritage has been exposed to the world, years ahead of schedule. You don't seem all that surprised, neither of you do. 
and try to slip back into my calm facade. But the scowl tugging at my lips makes that impossible. I figured out your dad's identity as soon as I learned about your second quirk. I just didn't care enough to state that I held this information. Shoto responds, The sins of the parents aren't the sins of the children. Momo's response surprises me the most. Hisashi just robbed her family. I expected a little bit of anger. The important thing is that this idea never makes it on the news or to the rest of the class. Shoto reminds them, How, once it hits the internet, it exists forever. If we bury it now, what stops it from being dug up later? Momo questions. If this gains traction, all of my good deeds won't matter. All of the gems I donated to charity won't stop the wave of hate. How many heroes will stand against me and attempt to remove me from UA? I bet my entire collection of gems that Endeavor will be our biggest issue if this goes to the mainstream media. Remember what happened to him during that fight with the guzzler. I comment after finally managing to dismiss the scowl on my face. He doesn't take losing well. I can still see his face twitch whenever someone mentions the fight with Abyssal. Shoto responds with a smirk. Shoto must really enjoy watching his father fail. I'm doomed. I can feel it in my bones. Today is the start of my doomsday. We got your back Izuku, no matter what. Right, Shoto? I feel Momo's soft hand clasp onto my shoulder. I feel my chest start to tighten. Right Shoto nods before I feel an ice cold hand slowly latch onto my other shoulder. Wait, does that mean his other hand is hot? Before this conversation can continue, the door opens. I look up and see Aizawa enter. I see his eyes focus on me briefly before he starts talking. It's too early for this Aizawa groans as he sees the crowd of reporters blocking the main entrance. Aizawa decides that dealing with the media isn't the best way to start the day. So he pulls out his ID card and presses it against part of the wall. This opens up a hidden door that allows him to enter the campus without attracting the attention of the media. As soon as Aizawa makes it inside the buildings, his phone starts to ring. It's Nezu. What now? Aizawa sighs before answering his phone. My office, now. He hangs up. Oh no Aizawa whispers. Nezu is a long-winded talker by nature. The fact that he only said three words is cause for alarm. Trepidation starts to bubble up in Aizawa's gut as he gets closer to Nezu's office. By the time he reaches the door, that sensation has started to bubble over. His facial expression and eyes are clearly displaying his fear. His hands are sweaty. He's weak in the knees and his arms are feeling heavy. Reaching for the door, Aizawa sighs in resignation and twists the knob. One gentle nudge and the door flies open. Big mistake. A wave of unchecked rage and darkness blasts Aizawa mere moments after the door opens. Come in, take a seat Nezu said. Aizawa isn't looking forward to the what's coming next. Hesitantly, he sits down on the comfy leather couch. Yet, Aizawa isn't comfy under Nezu's steely gaze. Do you know why you're here? Nezu asks calmly. Mind his family causing a fuss? Aizawa hopes. Yes, but that's not why you're here right now. Take a look at this screen. Tell me what you see. Nezu informs him before turning the computer monitor around. It's an article. Midoriya is related to a villain Aizawa answers. That's not the problem. This image has popped up enough to catch the attention of the bots we have scouring the internet for information about our students. The original post is only six hours old. Nezu replies. You don't like the controversy this will bring to UA. Aizawa realizes, in six hours, this image has spread to a hundred websites. I don't like the controversy for the school or the danger it presents to Midori. What happens now that his father is out? Will he try to attack Midoriya on the way home? What happens if other students find out? Will they isolate Midoriya or try to make him leave? Some may even be brash enough to attack him. The same goes for the heroes as well. We're looking at a potential civil war in UA. And the hero faction, as people rally against or with Midoriya. The civilians are bound to pick sides as well. I hate that there are so many questions that I can't answer. Nezu explains, but why Midoriya? He can't be the first student at UA. To have a villain as a parent, Aizawa asks, while clenching his fists, he isn't. Backdraft, 13, and Edshot are just a few UA. Alumni who have a villain parent or relative. The difference is that we buried that information in a way that prevents anyone from finding it. There's a reason nobody has seen 13's or Backdraft's face. Edshot's mouth stays covered and it isn't because of his obsession with Kakashi Haddock. Nezu said while rhythmically tapping his paws on the table. Why wasn't the same done for Midoriya then? Aizawa asks before sighing. It was. But unlike previous students, his villain relative escaped from the secret prison. I'm still looking into the how. What now? Aizawa asks while letting his shoulders slouch. First, we keep Midoriya away from the guzzler by minimizing the distance between him and Yue. It's time to implement the dorms, ahead of schedule. Nezu declares before dismissing Aizawa. This also keeps him away from the civilian population. Nezu gets up and starts pacing. Now, what to do? If the heroes turn against each other, what stops the serious villains from committing crimes out in the open? 
Humans really are foolish creatures. They don't realize how their actions affect things. Thanks to them, the balance of power between the three factions is about to be shaken. Class, today you have to pick your class representative and deputy representative. I don't care how you do it, just have it done before the bell rings. This is permanent for the rest of this year, so choose wisely. Aizawa announces before crawling into his yellow sleeping bag. He is too tired for today. Too much has happened and the school day just started. He somehow manages to sleep through the explosion of noise and disorder. Izuku would like to be picked, but there's no way he'd win a majority vote. He doesn't even remember most of the class names. He'd have to look in his hero analysis notebook. The only way Izuku sees himself winning is if it things are settled with a fight. Unfortunately for him, Ada managed to convince the class that a traditional election would be the best method. Soon enough, he had a ballot box that was fashioned from an empty box of tissue. Momo had offered to make one herself, but Ida declined the offer. Votes were cast and tallied within 10 minutes. Izuku had wanted to cast a vote for himself, but decided to vote for Momo at the last minute. All right class, the results are in. Shoto is class rep with four votes. Izuku is deputy rep with two votes Ida announces. Izuku immediately noticed that Momo had one vote. His vote. He doesn't understand why she didn't vote for herself. He also notices that Yuga has no votes. He looks at Yuga and Yuga stares back before holding up his thumb. I find it ironic that the quietest students are the voice of the class Kaminari whispers to Kayoka. I'm surprised you even know what irony is Kayoka replies. Mr. Aizawa, we're done. Ida informs him. This elicits a few groans. They were hoping to use the free time they had left. Do what you want. Just don't wake me up again Aizawa states before immediately going to sleep again. He somehow manages to stay asleep throughout the ensuing chaos. I have no idea how I won deputy representative. I don't even know these people. Yet, somehow I'm one of two people given a position of power. They'll regret it as soon as your dad's identity becomes more than a conspiracy theory. The voice is talking way too frequently now. That's the future, now's the present. Worry about it later I think as I stand in front of the class. Shoto is standing beside me with a blank expression on his face. I can never quite read that guy. It's like he lives inside his own head. Maybe he has another voice in his head too. It would explain why he seems as distracted as I do. I take a quick glance at Momo, hoping nobody notices. Apparently I failed miserably because I see Shoto looking at me with a knowing smirk on his face. Don't you have angsting to do I whisper as I subtly stab my elbow into his side. Don't you. Go back to your seats. You have five minutes until the bell. I don't care what you do as long as I'm not woken up. Aizawa draws. Oh no. If someone decides to start using their phone, the probability of them stumbling across the article about me increases dramatically. I can't afford to take that risk. Moments before the chaos began, I opened my mouth and spat out the first thing that came to mind. Fight club. That gets mixed results from my classmates. Katsuki's smile turns malicious. Ajiro starts to smile. That pink girl starts smiling. The guy who hardens smirks. Momo quirks her eyebrow. That mute guy who controls animals looks scared now. I make a mental note to ask if humans are able to be controlled by him as well. Everyone else displays varying amounts of surprise or confusion. What's fight club? Shoto whispers into my ear. How do you reference 300 during our fight, but not know about Fight Club? I whisper back. Everyone interested in joining should add their name to this list I'm about to start passing around. The location of this event is still undecided as of now, but it will be finalized before today's end. I announce as I whip out a sheet of paper the participants will be ranked based on the data I've compiled about you. You won't find a more detailed dossier anywhere else, unless you work for the government. They're always watching and collecting. I only do it at school. Liar. Go to hell I mentally hiss. Already here. The sheet starts to circulate around the room and I'm pleasantly surprised to see that the mute boy signs it after a moment of hesitation. Crisis averted for now. Now I have to just keep them distracted for the rest of the day. Are you ignoring me? How do you keep the attention of a group of teenagers? I make my way back to my desk. I have just enough time to grab my bag and get to the door before anyone else. As I pass the seats of my classmates, I get another great idea. Thanks brain. You are ignoring me. Let's see you ignore this. I stumble forward as a brief burst of pain shoots through my skull. If it weren't for the timely intervention of Shoji's hand tentacle things, I might have fell on my face. Thanks I mumble. Shoji just nods his head. They say birds of a feather flock together, so I guess quiet guys have to stick together too. Stop ignoring me. You should be more careful. Death by tripping into a table seems like a substandard way to die. The guy with a bird head comments from his seat. I really need to start learning names instead of just their quirks. Lunch rush is so weird. He doesn't fight crime, and nobody knows what his quirk does. He's just a glorified lunch man as far as I'm aware, who decides that they want to go to school and be a pro hero that serves healthy lunches to minors. My allies and I are currently sitting in the back of the cafeteria, with our backs to the wall. 
This food is so good Momo says. She had ordered three bowls of white rice. She claims it's because of her quirk. Bullshit. She would have ordered sugary meals if she was actually concerned about having more fat to use for her quirk. She just wants to eat. It's not like I can judge though. I look down at my plate full of nachos. There's a mountain of melted cheese, taco sauce, and ghost peppers. How can you eat that? Shoto asks, while firmly gripping his nose it smells like death. I just shrug my shoulders it tastes fine. I look at a different table and see a couple people looking down at their phones and then back towards me. Or do you look at that? People are starting to catch on. And the day is only halfway done. I mutter while nudging Shoto's head towards the table I was looking at. Indeed, it should become common knowledge before the day's end. Are you ready for a fight? Crush them under your heel. Grind them into bloodstained dust. Am I ready? Am I ready to be torn apart by ignorant reporters? Am I ready to have my words twisted to suit someone else's wicked agenda? Am I ready for the heroes bound to come after me? Whether it's because of their own bigoted views or an attempt to gain favor from the public. Am I ready to stand against the waves of undeserved hate? Am I ready to break the chains of fate? Crush all who oppose us. I'm ready. I'll stand against the waves of hate. I won't let fate chain me down so that everyone can watch me drown. When they try, I'll break those chains with my own will and determination. Bring it I declare while clenching my fists. A loud clanging sound blasts through the cafeteria, which is followed shortly by an alarm blaring. This isn't good I mumble as my peers start panicking like the children they are. There's no order, no structure. They're all pushing and shoving each other around as they rush for the exit. From our position, we can clearly see the courtyard full of those despicable reporters. We also see that somehow, they tore down the gate. One of them must have a powerful quirk. How else could they have accomplished that? You want to take this or should I intervene? I ask my allies, while simultaneously preparing for my next creation. You can take this one. Momo responds. It makes sense. I can do this without wasting anything if I'm careful and quick. That's the difference between our quirks. Her power is more versatile with what it can create. But mine has a lower cost as long as I play it safe. This isn't my problem. Shoto replies. I removed the upper half of my school uniform. I can't afford to destroy it. Well, actually I can, I just don't want to. My left arm, from the shoulder to the fist, begins to slowly secrete blue crystal. This color is the best choice when I need to manipulate crystals outside of my body. I couldn't explain why, but stretching this gem color has always been the easiest. Arm, I scream as the crystal coating my arm starts to expand. It has expanded beyond my arm, become thrice as thick as my arms, and it has become extremely heavy. Bucket loads of sweat are pouring down my face. I can barely see through it. This technique takes a lot of calories. I have to do this fast before I run out of time. I can't afford to lose this many calories at once. It'd be like going without eating for a week. With one mighty heave, the crystal limb rises from the ground and stretches to touch the ceiling. I stumble forward because the crystal arm and fist is screwing with my balance. I feel a cold hand latch onto my shoulder, helping me regain my balance. And with an even mightier swing, the fist returns to the floor. I can't help but smirk at the cracks I made in the tiles of the cafeteria's floor. That dent is nice too. The chaos has died down due to the sound created by my slam attack. Now almost everyone is looking at me. After wiping the sweat from my face, I point my right hand's index finger towards them and start yelling. Are you crazy? Why are all of you running around like chickens with their heads cut off? There's nothing to worry about. I start pointing out the window. Unless you think the pro heroes teaching us can't protect us from a simple reporter invasion. The crowd of students returns to their seats. Some of them still look scared. But are they afraid of the reporters or me? Now that that's over, I can start absorbing this crystal and finish my nachos. The crystal arm starts to recede back into my arm, where it'll return to its original form and redistribute throughout my body. Returning to my seat, I ask Shoto a very important question can you turn on the AC? It's hot in here. Screw dying of starvation, I'll sweat to death first. I can feel something in the air. A storm has been brewing for a while now. I hear it rolling over the horizon. I'm not sure when it'll hit, B but I know Midoriya has something to do with it. He's on edge, and so are his friends. Something happened between yesterday and today. His announcement of the fight club was haphazard and spontaneous. I can tell because of the confusion that flashed across Shoto's face. It's almost like he wanted to keep us from getting on our phones out of boredom. He's hiding something important, something dangerous. Now the question is, is it dangerous to us or just him? The frown on my face is covered by my mask, so nobody will ask about my changing facial expressions. I don't like this, I'll keep him under observation for now. I turn the end of one of my tentacles into another eyeball and subtly train it on him. I have an eye on him. Now I'll see everything he does and says. I lean against the back of the bus seat and calmly observe the interactions between my classmates. We see you Midoriya. Your turmoil is clear to anyone with eyes capable of piercing that crystal-induced facade you hide behind. 
With our eyes, your persona is easily seen through. Should I keep an eye on him? Dark shadow whispers from the confines of my soul. No, someone else has that covered. I whisper as I subtly shift my gaze from Midoriya to Shoji. A malevolent force is coming, we feel it in our bones. And that feeling keeps getting stronger and stronger as we get further and further from the safety of U.S. main building. They think I don't realize that they're watching me. They don't realize that their subtlety needs work. The lesser man might be oblivious, but I'm not. I know he sees me, I'm counting on that. Now, I need to see how he reacts. Depending on how his demeanor changes, I'll know I'm onto something. Or is this part of his plan? He's trying to do something that will make me trip up. He probably wants me to lash out and accuse him of spying on me. And once I do that, he'll deny my claims as me being paranoid about something that'd make someone think spying on me was worth their time. This gives him a perfect opportunity to question why I'm being so suspicious. Once he does that, it'll spark the same question in the minds of our peers why is he acting like that? I'd have to lie quickly and in a way that makes sense. And I'll need to lie for why I lied if I get called out on my lie. They don't trust you. I don't need their trust. I just need to avoid gaining their hostility long enough for me to prove undeniably that I'm a good guy. Fighting the Shadow Tamer and the man with four tentacles isn't a fight I think I can win. Three versus one is a bad situation for my quirk. My concentration would be spread too thin to maintain a large construct. The beast is fast. There's no time to make sure there isn't a soft spot on my creation for them to penetrate. I wouldn't have time to reabsorb the broken remains either. That requires me to stay stationary for too long. Getting dragged into melee range would be suicide. Shoji's strength and combat potential plus the range of the Shadow Tamer's beast makes it hard to avoid a loss in close range scuffle. I'd only be delaying the inevitable loss. My musings are cut short by Momo's voice. What are you thinking about? I casually tilt my head upwards so that my lip movements are obscured. We're currently being watched by three people. I respond before subtly gesturing towards Shoji, Tokyo, and his pet. There's no need to whisper anymore. The conversations of our peers have hit the perfect volume. They are loud enough to stop anything I say from being heard by anyone that isn't right next to my mouth. They won't do anything, not without just cause. They aren't the emotional type. Just stay calm, lay low, and act normal Momo tries to reassure me while touching my hand. While she's doing this I notice that she turned her head in a way that Shoji can't see her lips. Why is she touching my hand? Is she trying to make me invent a new shade of red? No, I doubt that. She must be trying to create the illusion that we're having an intimate moment. It gives her an alibi for turning her body in a way that's unnatural for a friendly conversation. How do you know how to profile people you only talk to once? Shoto asks. That's a good question. Momo spends most of her time around us or the girls. I can't remember the last time I saw her with another guy for longer than four minutes. Yeah, I timed it. That's not weird at all. Yes, it is. You time her bathroom breaks too. No, I don't. She's talking again. Pay attention before you miss a question. I must have missed her answer to Shoto's question because now they have both fallen silent. We stay silent as we get closer to the USJ. Suddenly, the bus swerved to the left, knocking half the class out of their seats and skids to a screeching halt. The controls are fried. Aizawa yells as he punches the bus's window. A menacing voice pierces through the bus's walls. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but your field trip has been cancelled. Then my world went black. More players is the first thing class wanna hears as the mist recedes their world returns to normal. But Izuku is more focused on something else. The pungent smell of blood saturating the air. Aizawa is having a similar train of thought. Who did they kill? The only people that would have been here were. Class 1B. They reserved the time slot ahead of ours. He shouts to gain the attention of his entire class. Class 1A, prepare to defend yourself by any means necessary. Meanwhile, the villains are having their own discussion. This just got interesting. Hisashi comments from behind his clear, plastic face mask. It only covers the area below the nose and there are two tubes connected to it that lead to a strange device on his back. Very interesting. That kid over there, isn't he your son? Shigaraki responds. He was, he's nothing to me now. Asashi's response irks Kirajiri. Family is the one thing that isn't supposed to be discarded for anything. I know that voice, Izuku thinks to himself. It's muffled but he can still identify the man behind the mask. That voice can never be forgotten. If he was closer, he'd recognize the eyes too. The rage simmering below the surface of Izuku is getting ready to bubble over. Finish your snack Namu. Get all of your experience points, then kill the rest of them Shigaraki commands, drawing attention to the black monster several feet away. It's chewing on something that looks disturbingly similar to a leg. He's eating someone Siro yells as he steps behind Shoto. This causes most of class wanted to retch and vomit onto the dirt. The only student left standing is Izuku, who's glaring at Hisashi. It's like he doesn't even notice what's going on around them. I'll distract them. The rest of you need to escape. We need to assume that Vlad King and Thirteen are dead and no backup is coming. 
Aizawa orders. I'm alive a voice gasps from under the ground. There's so much blood on the floor that nobody noticed the pit. Vlad King, are you alright? Aizawa asks. Yeah, we're hiding under a layer of blood. There are survivors. How many? Aizawa questions. Ten, but only two are conscious right now. He responds. Vlad pops out of the ground. His face splattered with the blood of his dead students and thirteen. Where are the others? Aizawa asks while keeping his eyes glued to the villains. The survivors are hiding in the pit too. Kosai Tsuburaba solidified the air and used it to stop the blood above them from falling down after I raised it over the hole. They have a temporary pocket of air. Vlad King whispers to Aizawa. Aizawa sighs in relief. Good, they're safe. Namu burps up part of a white puffy jacket. I'm bored. Kurajiri, send out the minions. Diyu diyu diyu. Izuku screams as he rushes forward. The reason for my doomed future is standing right in front of me. He doesn't even care that he murdered children that were my age. Kill him. He's here to finish what he started. End him. Heroes aren't supposed to kill. But accidents happen in dire situations. Aizawa authorized it as soon as he said any means necessary. I can't stop myself from giving in to the voice's demands. I start creating something. Twin blades are the simplest weapon to create for the good deed I'm going to commit. Momo notices something in Izuku's hands. Red crystals, explosion, pink crystals, homing shots and easier midair flight control. White, unknown. Blue, easier shape manipulation. Yellow and green, unknown. What does black do? She questions aloud. It's Katsuki who answers. It disintegrates whatever it touches. He's planning to kill his father. Katsuki knows that the only reason Izuku would pull out the black crystals on a human is if the target is his father. Why isn't it disintegrating his hands? Shoto asks as he preps an icy blast. The minions are pouring out of the black mist creature's portals. Look closer, you'll see that he's holding onto pink handles. Katsuki answers before blasting a villain in the chest. How do we stop him from killing his father? Momo asks as she smacks a villain in the face with a metal staff. We don't Shoto and Katsuki respond in unison. They're back to back, fighting the horde of villains spilling out of the mist that's starting to spread across the battlefield. They've lost track of the rest of the class in the horde. Pardon moi. Yuvi yells as he crashes next to Momo. He's still a little green in the face. There's a hole in his shirt and a patch of burnt skin on his chest. Yuga makes a mental note to him while firing his lasers at the villain hiding a mirror in his shirt. He starts talking as soon as he stands up. Leave this area to me. Izuku will need your support. I'll stay behind too. Momo says as she recreates her lightsaber. This one only has one tube and is a bright white. Suit yourself. The good fight is where we're going. Let's fucking murder some clowns. Icy hot. Katsuki screams as he sprints away. Blasting people left and right while screaming obscenities the entire time. Eat shit. Eat shit and die. Eat shit and live. Useless fuckwads. Put up a fight. He has issues Shoto thinks as he follows behind the explosion obsessed team. Izuku is on a war path, cleaving through anyone who dares stand between him and his target. Brutal spin kick to the face of a villain with a glass visor on her helmet, sending shards of glass into her eyes. Gah, all I see is glass and blood. Savage elbow strike to the back of somebody's neck that's swiftly followed by a ball-busting knee strike to the groin. That villain will never walk again or have kids. The next villain Izuku comes across actually manages to somewhat defend himself, dodging the roundhouse kick to the dick, but he is demolished by a punch to the kidney. This villain collapses to the floor in a puddle of his own body fluids. Izuku tosses his blades into the air and hits the following villain with a double palm strike to the stern. Stay out of my way Izuku whispers coldly as he lands one more punch on the villain's stomach. His blades land in his hands and he keeps running towards Hisashi. All for one is sitting at his desk staring blankly at the wall. Soon you will finally be able to rest, little brother. All might will die today and one for all will be destroyed, freeing your spirit. Your soul will finally be at peace and away from the conflict we started all those years ago. Only then will I allow myself to truly leave this world and briefly rejoin you in the afterlife. Maybe you'll forgive me for my mistake, but will the gods? He sighs. He misses his little brother more than he'll ever admit aloud. The age of heroes and villains was a mistake forced into existence by the rash actions of a man mad with power. That man has grown wiser over his lifetime. If he did things right the first time, he could have went down in history as a god amongst men, founder of the Quirk Age. Now, he'll be lucky to go down as a footnote. In the present, in his broken body, he regrets a lot of things. Unsurprisingly, most of them lead back to you, one for all. He regrets forcing that quirk on you. The quirk that stockpiles power was the weakest in the arsenal, so he had no reason to use it. But he knew it would keep you safe if he couldn't one day. It was only after that fateful event that he realized what else it did. He felt a horrible sensation in his chest, like part of himself had vanished along with the quirk, as if part of his soul had been violently ripped out of his chest and locked away. That made him realize it wasn't just stockpiling physical strength or quirks, it was stockpiling fragments of the holder's soul. 
who knew that souls counted as a form of power. Your hidden ability to give away your quirk allowed it to evolve into one for all and gain access to even more souls, more strength, and more quirks each time it was passed to the next guy. Some days I wonder if it took a part of all for one with it. That would explain why he couldn't steal it back from any of your successors and put an end to this. All might must die before a successor is found. The chaos and deaths that would arise from his pawns killing the symbol of peace is just necessary collateral damage in the mind of all for one. He doesn't care what happens to the world anymore. While Izuku is fighting to end a life, the rest of Class 1 is fighting to preserve their lives. Any luck with that door? Fumikage asks as Dark Shadow crushes a group of villains underneath his talons. Strangely, this method of assault hasn't killed anyone yet. Broken bones and external bleeding are the only injuries that have been inflicted. His goal is keeping enemies away from Rikido, Mizo, and Ida. Yeah, it's slowly opening up. Mizo somehow manages to reply despite the fact that his jaw is clenched shut. He has six hands wedged between the doors trying to pry it open. His veins have swelled so much that it's gotten to the point that he's worried they're about to burst. Alongside him is everyone's favorite sugar boy. Rikido inhaled a chocolate cake to activate Sugar Rush. This resulted in him gaining the strength of five Rikidos. But that also means he has less intelligence than he used to have. Fortunately for him though, the process of prying open a door has no need for a high intelligence stat. Even with their combined might, the door is only budging inches at a time. Hurry up please. Toru squeaks as she narrowly dodges a purple fireball. Yeah, I wasn't built for this Achako says as she touches two villains. All she can do is make two villains float into the air before letting gravity do its job. Her quirk was never meant for large-scale battles like this. Kaminari zaps a villain that was spitting water everywhere. Mr. Aizawa, I'm going to follow Izuku and the others. They can't be hurt by my quirk when I go all out. Go ahead, but watch your back. These villains are playing for keeps, Aizawa says as he wraps his scarf around a villain's arms. He picks the unfortunate villain up and starts using his body against the group of villains as a miniature wrecking ball. He even uses him to intercept a hail of needles that was heading towards Mina. Mina is having some trouble fighting the villains. Her acid spray is useless for stopping the villains without physical mutations from advancing because she doesn't want to kill them with it by accident. The only thing she can do to knock them out is slide on acid to make her fast enough for hand-to-hand -hand combat. Or melt the floor to make pit traps. Ribbit, see you says as she crashes into a villain that was about to hit Achako from behind. Where's Kirishima at? He's over there with Siro. Achako replies as she touches her fingers together, sending two villains plummeting into one of Mina's pits. This is manly Kirishima thinks as he's slammed into another villain by Siro's tape. They got this idea by watching Aizawa. Kirishima's hardening quirk makes him a perfect wrecking ball. Kayoka is blasting every flying villain who comes too close with a burst of disorienting sound, which has resulted in several foes crashing into each other in midair. Koji is cowering behind Ida because he can't use his quirk to help here. Koji, you have to fight. Ida yells. I can't do it, my quirk is useless here. Koji shouts, catching Ida off guard. He didn't know Koji could speak at all. You won't know unless you try. Call out as loud as you can and maybe a flock of birds will show up to help. Ida exclaims. Fine, help you s. Koji screams. Nothing seems to happen for several tense seconds. Why is Namu standing up? Shigaraki asks. We didn't give him any instructions. That kid can control animals. And Namu is technically a human, therefore he's an animal. He has no intelligence or willpower of his own, so resistance is impossible. You need to command him yourself if you want to override that kid's quirk, Kirijiri explains. They were hoping that his cowardice would prevent him from trying to fight back at all. Namu vanishes in a blur and smashes a blonde villain into the ground head first, crushing it like a watermelon in the process. This process is repeated on a villain that looks like he's part fish. He even has fins on his arms and gills on his neck. The next villain gets his throat torn out by Namu's teeth, spraying blood all over the Namu's face. Stop, Namu. Shigaraki barks. This makes the creature pause moments before his teeth would have sunk into another neck. Keep going. Koji yells, causing Namu to bite through a girl's spine with an audible crunch. Stop. Shigaraki orders. Go. Koji screams. Children, Kirijiri thinks from the sidelines. He would help Tamira, but all for one gave him specific instructions. He isn't allowed to intervene at all unless All Might appears. Hisashi is about to be killed, or Tamira is in danger of dying. Otherwise, he just would have dropped all of them into a volcano and been done with this farce. Cobbling Tamura now would stifle him later once he becomes the real leader of the League of Villains. Shoto and Katsuki are still fighting their way towards Izuku. Shoto is freezing anyone unlucky enough to be on the right side of him. Meanwhile Katsuki is nuking the hell out of everyone in front on them or on his left. Izuku has finally reached his father. It's been so long. Izuku yells as he wildly slashes at Hisashi. You've missed so many holidays and birthdays. I'll just have to give you all the gifts you missed at the same time. 
Hisashi calmly weaves between each slash, bending backwards to avoid having his eyes cut out. Izuku tries to capitalize on Hisashi's positioning, but Hisashi is prepared for this. Izuku's efforts get him kicked in the stomach by two feet and sent several feet away. This does very little damage to him, but it pisses Izuku off nonetheless. If he wasn't seeing red already, he is now. How dare you lay a hand on me? Stand there and die. Izuku screams as he throws his twin blades at Hisashi and his upper body starts glowing pink. No thanks, Hisashi grunts as he sidesteps one spinning blade. But the other blade veers left and severs one of Hisashi's plastic tubes. Izuku starts to cackle madly as the front of his gym shirt is shredded to pieces by a swarm of pink crystal shards. Izuku points at Hisashi and a shard rockets towards him with the speed of an arrow, piercing through his left hand effortlessly. Red life juice is leaking out of a hole that's the size of a quarter. He waves his hand from right to left and the entire swarm of shards follow his hand movement. This wave is much slower than the individual shard was, so Hisashi is able to avoid it easily. I was going to kill you last, but I guess you can die before Inko, Hisashi comments as he pushes a button on the machine strapped to his back. Flames shoot through the uncut tube and into Hisashi's open maw. Take your best shot. Izuku taunts before pounding the center of his chest with his left fist and spreading his arms apart. If you insist, Hisashi smirks as he removes his face mask. This is immediately followed by him spewing a stream of red flames. Izuku notices that the fire is much smaller than all the other times Hisashi has used his quirk. Big mistake. Izuku whispers as a wicked grin spreads across his face. He stretches his mouth open as wide as it can go and starts to suck in air like a vacuum. This current of wind funnels the flames into his mouth and down to his stomach. Izuku can feel his stomach being slowly burned by the fire raging inside of it. Due to the enhanced durability granted by Dragon's Breath, it hasn't started to hurt yet. It is starting to be uncomfortable though. It's like he chugged an entire bottle of hot sauce without pausing. And he knows that as soon as he spits it out his mouth and throat will be slightly burned by his flames as well. No way, the brat has my quirk too. Hisashi thinks as he watches the stream of fire vanish down the throat of his son. It's a good thing I have Dragon's body too. Dragon's body was the quirk of Hisashi's sister. Instead of releasing elements out of her mouth, she was able to use them to improve her physical abilities as well as create ranged attacks that depended on punching and kicking. This means that she never had to worry about lung damage. I'm all fired up. Izuku taunts before he spits a wall of red flames with small clumps of blue spread throughout it. As the wall of flame gets closer, Hisashi swallows a big gulp of air. Hisashi begins to swing his right arm straight forward then curves it to the left. The air around him follows this movement, creating a tunnel of wind between him and the flame that forces the flame to curve around him. In retaliation, Izuku starts to rapid-fire his pink crystal shards, cutting through the wall of flames and wind. The wind slightly alters the flight path of the crystals, meaning that the one aimed for the neck landed in the shoulder instead. Let's see your wind stop this. Izuku screams as another shard pierces Hisashi's shoulder. Son of a bitch, Hisashi utters as the hail of shards stop. His body is riddled with cuts that go all the way through him. He falls onto his face moments later. The flames around them have burned themselves out, giving Izuku a clear view of the body. Izuku fires a couple more shards at his face just to be sure that he's dead. Izuku takes a deep breath and exhales smoke. He's dead. He's dead. He's dead. He turns around and sees that Shoto and Katsuki are running up to him. This is the best day ever, Izuku vocalizes. I just killed that bastard. His mouth is still smoking from swallowing fire. Izuku coughs into his hand, spitting out a plume of smoke. Did you remember to double tap? Katsuki asks. Yeah, I pierced every limb at least once and hit his heart twice and cut part of his brain. Izuku replies. I guess he isn't so tough when his enemy's main method of attacking isn't an element. Shoto states. Izuku shakes his head in denial. He was weaker than he used to be. All that time in prison made him lose his edge. He fires a couple more shards through Hisashi's dead body, just because he can. What was that for? Shoto asks. It was mostly for fun. Izuku responds with a devilish smirk on his face as he walked towards Hisashi. He plans to take that machine strapped on his back. If this is what he stole from Yeirazu Incorporated or Hatsum Industries, he'll give it back. If not, Izuku will keep it for himself. Is it just me or is he acting very out of character now? Katsuki whispers to Shoto when Izuku isn't looking at them. He snapped. Hopefully he'll be back to normal by tomorrow. Shoto whispers back. Izuku had successfully pulled the machine away from Hisashi's dying body when he got an idea. Let's hide the body, Izuku thinks as he recalls his blades to his hands. The black crystals will completely disintegrate his body. No proof that he was killed would remain. Izuku flips his blades so that they're both pointing towards the ground at an angle and with a mighty slam, both blades find a home in Hisashi's back. The trio walks away from the disappearing body, leaving the crystal to do its job. 
This error gives Kirijiri a way to teleport Hisashi to All for One's base without being noticed. Hisashi will be healed again, but Izuku doesn't know that. When he looks behind him, Izuku doesn't see a body. All he sees is his blades wedged into the ground. The crystals did their job well, Izuku thinks while whistling a jovial tune. Happy that the nightmare is over. Maybe I'll start getting decent amounts of sleep again. Quirks are weird, I get that. I mean, look at my quirk that lets me get hit by cars going less than 50 miles per hour attaining a new bruise at the most. They can do anything, and mutate in amazing ways. But this guy's bone quirk is a step too far if you ask me. A lesser man would have a hole in their chest because of those high-speed pieces of tissue, calcium, and collagen. Luckily for me, my hardened exterior can handle the blows. Barely. I subconsciously rub a purple bruise on my neck. Another volley of bones shoot out of that shirtless, white-haired bastard's fingertips. I try to evade them by moving right, but I fail horribly. Maybe next time I'll duck instead. I hear a shrill scream coming from behind me. My head turns so fast that it hurts. I recognize that scream. I've heard it enough to know who it belongs to. Mina. Izuku stops walking and closes his eyes to concentrate on something else. What are you doing and why are your eyes closed? Shoto asks as dozens of pink diamond shards start coalescing. What does it look like I'm doing? And my eyes are closed because it helps me visualize my creations better. My brain isn't receiving images from my eyes, so I can maintain a greater focus on what I want to make. Making the creation time faster than it would normally be if I had to sift through more visual information every second. Allowing me to properly and quickly visualize the structure of my crystal creations without error. Izuku explains. Uh, what? Shoto asks with a blank look on his face. Eyes closed equals faster creation. Which is bad for a fight, so he's doing it now. Katsuki answers. Done, Izuku states, regaining their attention. They look towards him, finding a circular pink diamond shield with a spiral design floating in front of him. Behind him is a pink diamond shield that's much more intricate and segmented. The top and sides are pentagons. The middle is made of elevated triangles that form a pyramid with uneven sides. And the bottom is made of two triangles that have connected edges. They look down to see also a cloud of diamond dust floating under him. When did you figure that one out? Katsuki asks. Izuku has never made something that small before. Last night, I figured out that it'd be easier to break Senbon's Akurake Joshi into smaller and smaller fragments than it'd be to create millions of microscopic gems. Izuku replies. You were up all night again. I told you that you need to sleep at night. This isn't healthy. Katsuki yells as he stomps over to Izuku. It's fine. I'm still functioning at full kappa. Izuku is cut off by Katsuki grabbing one of his shields and cracking it with one strike. See what I mean? I couldn't break the first shield you ever made, and that one was hollow. Your creations aren't shit right now. I had a harder time breaking dinner plates. Izuku places a hand on the shield and it starts to glow. The crack slowly mends, leaving the shield as if it never cracked at all. Katsuki punches it again. This time, nothing happens. He nods once before turning on his heel. Katsuki follows this by blasting into the air. I feel like I just got one up by Bakugo. Izuku thinks as he floats after Bakugo. I never thought I'd live to see the day Bakugo did that. Izuku hears the sound of running feet coming from behind him. He immediately identifies it as the sound of Shoto's running. You know I can't fly. Turning around, Izuku responds, you probably could. Hot and cold air makes a tornado. I'm sure you could use that to fly. Shoto leaps onto the cloud, sinking three inches before he's raised to the surface. I'm not experimenting with tornado creation while I'm surrounded by classmates. Izuku sees through that. He knows Shoto saw him use dragon's breath, which means Shoto knows that if the tornado goes haywire, Izuku could suck it up. However, repelling this villain attack, mourning the deceased, and salvaging whatever sanity class Wana has left comes first, second and third. W why is your arm on my waist? Izuku asks as they fly over to the USJ's exit. Shoto is clinging to Izuku's body. I'm afraid of heights. Shoto deadpans. More specifically, he's afraid of falling from heights. Getting dropped by a bird was a very mentally scarring experience, even if he wasn't awake to see the fall itself. Just knowing the end result of his fall is enough for Shoto to know that falling should be avoided by whatever means necessary. I could have made you an owl and named it Hedwig. Izuku replies. At least with a bird, Shoto has something to hold on to. Something that isn't Izuku's waist. Shoto tightens his grip at the mention of a bird. I'm good. Kirishima is cradling Mina in his arms as bone projectiles rapidly batter his back. There's a small hole in Mina's chest that blood is seeping out of. Suddenly, the attacks just stop. I'm curious. You still protect her even though you're in the middle of a fight. Why? Isn't it better to forsake her and save yourself? The white-haired villain asks from right behind Kirishima. Mina is more important to me. She's been there for me for as long as I can remember. In my position, she'd fight to save us both, no matter what. If I leave her to die here, then I can't call myself a man. 
Hiroshima responds. What he didn't mention is that only a dick would leave his girlfriend to die. Interesting. You fight for love, and you're ideal. The white-haired villain replies as he sits down cross-legged. I don't like killing kids or lovers, that's why I chose to only attack you. Your quirk would let me knock you out instead of snuffing out your flame. Make haste to a medic and patch up your lover. I will give you an opening to escape. A villain that doesn't kill kids or lovers. That's a new idea to Kirishima's young mind. Villains aren't supposed to have morals and ethics. They're supposed to be irrational monsters consumed by greed and the desire to hurt. Kirishima stands up, carrying Mina bridal style. Why are you a villain? That quirk could be used for good. That's how the cards fell for this orphan. I never had a chance to be a hero. He responds, standing up as well. Every time I tried to do good, people would run in fear at my quirk, they called it monstrous. I never even made it to the top 8,000. Hiroshima starts walking away, you shouldn't have given up. There are some situations where you have to keep trying over and over, even if the world never appreciates it, even if you're never the strongest or flashiest hero. There's always going to be that small group supporting you in what you do. You can't give up. Heroics isn't about the popularity, become a hero and I'll support you every step of the way. Hiroshima isn't sure if that message was just for the villain or if he was telling that to himself as well. It isn't too late for him. Small-time villains still have a chance to become a hero. Oh yeah, what's your name? Shiro he says as a pointy. White bone the length of his arm slides out of his right arm and into his hand. High-speed bone regeneration is the only explanation for why his arm isn't a limp flesh noodle right now. Quirks are weird. Good luck. Shiro Kirishima whispers as Shiro stabs a villain in the leg with the pointy end of his bone. Izuku and Shoto have been floating towards the door for several minutes. Izuku hasn't even had to move his arms much at all. His shields respond to thought, so he can effortlessly send them to intercept projectiles aimed at the backs of his classmate. And Namu is still in the process of killing villains, which Izuku still can't believe is happening. What idiot would bring a weapon he can't control? Namu, kill that brat. Shigaraki screams. Who is he talking about? Izuku thinks as Namu leaps into the air, judging by his trajectory. He's heading towards the door. Izuku turns his gaze towards the door and scans the people there. Shoji and Rikido are panting on the ground next to an open door. Ida isn't there anymore. Kirishima is standing there looking relieved. Koji is cowering on the ground. He's trying to kill Koji. Shoto states, I won't let him. Izuku declares, violently shoving his finger towards Koji's wide-eyed form. Both shields rocket towards Koji. The circular shield situates itself behind the other shield kid's mid-flight. It's not going to make it in time, Shoto states. I don't need two voices telling me that, Izuku thinks as he bites his lower lip. Loosen your grip on my waist. I need to breathe. Izuku opens his maw and start to suck in air. So, it wasn't a fluke, Shoto thinks as Izuku expels a gust of wind. The gust of wind is just what his shields needed. They land right above Koji right before Namu lands on top of him. Unfortunately for Koji, the shields weren't designed to block attacks with the strength of All Might. If they were, maybe Koji wouldn't have a hole in his stomach. There's blood dumping onto the floor right next to a good chunk his stomach and intestines. Clumps of fat, muscle and skin litter the floor as well. Stomach acid is starting to dissolve everything between his stomach and the immediate path to the stony floor. Ayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayay
I'm sorry. Vile, evil, reprehensible pests. I hope all of you burn in the deepest pits of hell for this. If I scoured all of human history, I bet I'd never find a group half as evil as yours. None with a leader so vile. None with a cause so worthless. They killed our friend. What are you going to do about it? I will exterminate every last one of them. I roar as I leap off the crystal dust cloud. Leave me alone. I scream as I continue to back away. There's no way for me to escape. My quirk is at its limit. If I try to use it again there's no telling what will happen. And even if I could, I can't float away before he leaps after me again. My foot goes over an edge and I look back. To my horror, I see one of Mina's acid pits. There's no time to crawl around it, it's hopeless. I look forward again and see the Namu towering over me with his fist held high. I close my eyes and give up. I'm dead. I will exterminate every last one of them. That sounds like Izuku. He sounds so angry. No, that scream was a mix of unfiltered bestial rage and regrets. Wait, why aren't I dead yet? Not that I'm complaining, or anything. G-G-R-I-I-I-I-H-H. A gust of wind sends me skidding backwards towards the edge. Both of my legs are dangling now. I hesitantly open my eyes and see Namu being squeezed in a white crystal hand with six fingers. While tracing the thick arm back to its source, my jaw drops. A colossal titan of crystals. That has the full body of a human. The head has on a helmet with a long Tengu-like nose and two tiny horns jutting out of his forehead. It has a jagged mouth, giving it an almost demonic appearance. There are no eyes. It kind of looks like a statue if you ask me. It has to be 30 feet tall at the least. I can see Izuku's body in the torso. He must have used clear crystals to see and hollowed out a place to stand. The torso also seems to be the thickest part of the body. There's no doubt that he wants to avoid getting punched. If I had to make an estimate, I'd say that it's just inches thicker than Namu's arm is long. Tears stream down my cheeks, I'm saved. I pull myself from over the ledge and I start sprinting away as fast as my legs will let me. They'll pay, they'll all pay. But first, Namu shall be obliterated, mangled beyond all forms recognition. And after that, I'm coming for you Kirajiri. Then I'm going to capture the guy with hands on his face and make sure he's buried under the prison. I don't care what it costs, me and my Suzanu will be the end of you. Suzanu is meant to be my ultimate defense and offense, a towering behemoth that no ordinary foe will ever overcome. I'll pass out soon, but this battle will end in five minutes. Freedom to attack and defend without any worry. And it only cost me all but the bare minimum of calories my body needs to function. Using the white crystal as a double-edged sword though, I'll lose access to every color for a while after this. Everything I make will be inert and clear like glass. No homing shots, no explosions, no midair shape manipulation, no stamina boosts, no healing, and no stamina drains. But right now, I can access every color power. Achako is safe now, so I can finally make a move without worrying about hurting a wonderful person that's full of energy and compassion. My indescribable fury is starting to diminish back into simple anger and the desire to protect. The Suzanu's arm that has a hold on Namu is slowly raising into the air. I command it to fling Namu towards Kirajiri and the other guy. Namu rockets into the mist, reappearing several inches to the left, slamming headfirst into the flood zone of the USJ and creating a wave that drenched. Shoot, I was hoping to hit two birds with one stone. A stupid, evil stone. Anyways, might as well play clean up until tall, dark and fugly gets back up. I command my right arm to turn to dust and I sends it swarming towards Aizawa. First, I need to bring Aizawa into the Suzanu. If my theory is right, Nama won't be able to put a scratch on my Suzanu if its quirk is deactivated. While my dust swarm is doing that, I turn my eyes to Koji's body that has dropped to the ground. I need to make sure it doesn't accidentally get destroyed. The rest of my class is falling back and getting near the open gate. All of them are looking green in the face from up here. Hopefully Ida will be back with All Might soon. All Might was the reason they attacked after all. It'd be a shame if he never made an appearance. The events line up too perfectly. All Might's job gets reported to the world, then villains raid UA. That same day, they killed half a class and just stayed there, waiting for someone else to arrive, instead of running like smart villains would have. There was an astronomically high chance of getting an entire school of heroes turned on them, and they know that. But they stayed, waiting for someone in particular. I turn the head into orbs and tell them to swarm around my class. Heal whatever wounds they have and boost their stamina. I wish I could use that stamina boost on me. I'm starting to feel sleepy and in pain at the same time. While those swarms are doing that, I fall to my knees clutching my stomach. I feel the Suzanu start to quiver. Stay together for just a little while longer. I need to make sure they stay safe. I whisper, wait, I'm an idiot. If I eat flames, I can turn that into calories that'll soothe this stomach pain. I pull the device off my back and cut it on, unleashing a pillar of red flames. Slurp. Anything is tasty when you're hungry enough. I pat my stomach and sigh in relief. It felt like I was about to have a full-body cramp. Not fun at all. 
The device returns to my back and I prepare to stand up. I stand up straight as the Suzanu stops trembling. Just in time too. Because Aizawa is being dragged through the crystals. A hole opening up for him to be slid through. The crystals return to being an arm moments later. I could have handled that group of mutant quirks users by myself. You didn't have to swoop in and save me. Aizawa grumbles. I know. Believe me. I know how skilled you really are. But I can't beat Namu if his punches keep shattering my shit. I respond. Eraserhead isn't public figure. But he still has an official list of accomplishments and a record. He has the lowest number of collateral damage fines. He has the most arrests. But that isn't common knowledge. And he's tied with Ingenium for fastest villain takedown. Once again that isn't publicized due to Eraserhead not giving a fuck. If you group the underground heroes into a separate list. Eraserhead is the number one underground hero by far. I need you to negate Kirajiri's quirk so that I can grab the guy with the freaky hand fetish and scratching fetish. I explain. Aizawa sighs. All right, but what is this thing? This is Suzanu, my ultimate attack and defense technique. I want a 20-page essay about why you shouldn't name your moves after our gods, Aizawa states while facepalming. Whatever, let's just do this. I'm not changing it. The Suzanu's left arm stretches out towards the hand guy, and it keeps stretching, further and further losing more and more diameter the farther out it stretches. The hand wraps around the villain's body and reels him in. Kirajiri is utterly helpless thanks to Eraserhead's erasing quirk. Too easy, I thought this would take more effort. I expected him to at least be able to dodge the first swipe. I trap his hands and arms in the crystal, pinning him to the floor. Whatever, my job is all the easier now. The villain has been unceremoniously dropped on his ass and is inside my Suzanu, helpless. That warp villain can't get in here. Those types of quirks usually require the destination to be in the user's line of sight or they need prior knowledge about the location, coordinates or a description. They need a place they can picture in their mind. My plan is flawless. Now, I just have to end this before I have to reabsorb this Suzanu in three minutes. I'm not letting this many calories be wasted. Wait, question for later, do my crystals count as earth? I can create ones that are identical to the real thing, so maybe I can cheat the system. So, you're the leader of this band of misfit bitches, I comment. That means I get to beat you senseless and not feel bad about it later. I slam my fist into his jaw and his head snaps back. I turn and look at Aizawa. Do you have a problem with this? No, just don't kill him. The proper authorities will want him alive. That's all I needed to hear before I start letting loose. Eleven kids are dead because of you. Kidney punch. Eleven innocent children that just wanted to make the world a safer place are dead. Dick punch. D. Kick. A. Stomach stomp. A. Kick. D. Dick stomp. Never have kids asshole. What type of monsters are you? I scream. After taking deep heavy breaths. Annihilate him. Put the fear of death in his eyes. Make him quiver and spasm at the mere mention of your name from this day forward. I will exterminate all of you pests. I growl as I punch a hand off of his face. Nobody else will die because a pest with a quirk decided the world needs to burn. I just start wailing on his chest and stomach with punches. Right, 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 left, 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 right, left, kick, kick, knee slam, and pause. Knee slam on his junk. I stand back up and see an expression of pure agony on his face. He squeaks before talking in a slightly higher pitch than usual. How dare you do that to Tamura Shigaraki? The League of Villains leader isn't your punching back. He make a feeble attempt to kick me with one of his free legs. A simple step to the right is all I need to avoid it. I take deep breaths, trying to calm myself down. Do you feel better? Aizawa deadpans. I completely forgot that he was there, and he heard my rage-filled screaming. I take a look at his battered and beaten body. His lip is split. He has dark bruises on his face and I'm willing to bet my All Might action figures that his torso and lower body have darker bruises. A little bit I respond. And they say catharsis is bad for your health. They must have been doing it wrong because I feel great. And I still have 1 minute and 30 seconds. What are those orbs? Is the general thought among the students of Class 1A, Kosai, Itsuka and Vlad King. Out of nowhere 20 plus white orbs fell out of the sky and landed around them. They're all sitting by the gate, nursing bandage-covered wounds. Vlad's right arm is in a sling. Achako touches one and it immediately shatters. I suddenly feel great. Achako, the cut on the side of your cheek is sealing itself shut, Momo points out. She was moments away from applying a small bandage to it. Achako looks at the shattered remains of the ball and something clicks. These balls are healing crystals. She announces, Izuku is helping us even when he's fighting elsewhere. Momo starts barking out orders. Heal yourselves while we have time. That monster will rise up any minute. We need to be ready to assist Izuku when that moment arrives. And where is Shoto? Up here, Shoto says, prompting Momo to look up at a half-made bridge of ice above their heads. Shoto couldn't make the cloud move, so he just froze the top and spread the ice forward. 50. Kirajiri is finally able to do something because Shigaraki is most likely about to die. He saw what Izuku was going to do to his own father. There are two gaping holes in his back. 
Who knows what he'd do to someone responsible for his classmate's death. Black mist shrouds white crystal legs of the Suzanu. It sinks into a portal. The part of the legs that falls through ends up in the flood zone. There's no way that Titan can float in water, so they'll sink into the water where Namu can decimate them or they drown. Hirajiri doesn't care either way at this point. All for one won't care as long as All Might is killed. Shigaraki starts laughing. You haven't won yet. I still have an extra life. Why can't villains ever just give up? Shigaraki yanks his hand upward, shattering the crystal trapping them. He punches Aizawa in the nose, breaking it. The crunch was almost inaudible. Damn it, damn it, damn it. How do people keep breaking my shit? This is the third time on the same godforsaken day. You can't escape this Suzanu. The only way out is if you punch through it. I proclaim. Shigaraki reaches into his pocket and I rush forward. I don't like that look on his face. I would create a weapon. But I need most of my focus on holding this titan together. We're sinking, Aizawa states. Kurajiri. I should have known that he'd try something sneaky. He must know that there's a hole at the top that water can come through. He must be planning to drown us under the rightful assumption that this thing can't float and I can't swim. But the water isn't that deep. Wait, Namu. If we get knocked over by its punches, water will flood and drown us. If it breaks through the crystal, we're dead. I punch Shigaraki on the stomach, hoping to make him drop whatever he's holding. All that gets me is blood spat on my face. I recoil as he slams his palm into my stomach. I let out the loudest scream I've ever made in my life. Pain. Excruciating pain. Looking down, I see the skin around his hand flaking away. Oh shit, he has a disintegration quirk. I hurriedly push him away and feel blood trickling down my stomach. Shit, I need to stop the bleeding. I put my hand on the floor and start letting it regenerate the recently lost flesh. The healing crystal can fix everything except the missing nerves and death. And great, now the Suzanu is shaking again. I really hate that big creations need my constant attention. There are too many parts and segments for me to keep it together subconsciously. There's a black flash and suddenly me and Aizawa are the only ones in the crystal. Fuck, he got away. Which means that Freak should be getting new orders in 3, 2, 1. Namu, attack. Well, fuck. I guess up I have to settle for a half-healed hole in my torso. The bleeding has stopped, so I guess that's something. Just run away with the others. I can hold them off long enough for the other pros to get here. Aizawa utters after a moment of silence. He wants us to leave him to die. He knows he can't win against all three villains at once. We can still fight. You don't have tea. You're too injured and so are they. If you continue fighting, you will be killed. Just look at you. A couple more seconds and you'd have had a hole clean through your body. These guys are out of your league right now. You shouldn't have had to face these guys at all. Aizawa snaps. Too bad. We are. I whisper before swatting Namu out the air. He doesn't look the least bit hurt from being sent head first into water. Crashing into the ground didn't hurt it either. Neither does slamming the fist on it. It must have some type of shock absorption as well as super strength. It has two quirks. That just means I have to tear it apart instead of beating it. We're still sinking, and we aren't done talking yet. I reply immediately, are we going to talk or save lives? I ignore Aizawa's response as I start trying to figure out what to do about our imminent swim. Wait, that anime character's Suzanu had wings. Mine should have wings too. Just have to take some crystals from the arms and shoulders. Push it to the back of the Suzanu. Expand the two bulges until there's full-length angel wings. I look behind me and see exactly what I had imagined. Two white crystals shaped like stereotypical angel wings. I didn't need wings in order to make it fly. I never need wings in order for my creations to soar like a majestic eagle. It's just easier to pull on them than trying to mentally lift the entire object. That goes double for now. I can guarantee that. Right now, if current me tried to lift the entire Suzanu at once I would lose focus on maintaining it. It would come crashing down. And then I would die. If this fall doesn't kill me, Nama will. The arms are half the size they used to be, making it look like the Suzanu skipped arm day at the gym. I close my eyes and float up. I keep ascending until I feel the Suzanu shake. What now? Namu's clinging to the arm. Now it's leaping through the air again. What's your brilliant plan to get rid of it? Aizawa asks with his arms crossed. Erase away his quirk and you'll see. I tersely respond. We land outside of the black mist. The Suzanu is dripping water onto the ground. No quirk means no super strength. No super strength means my crystals won't be. Boom. Fuck me. The Suzanu is pushed backwards because of the muddy dirt. Namu is clinging to the clear part of the upper body now. Taking a glance at Aizawa reveals the red eyes and floating hair indicative of his quirk being active. That landing just cracked part of the Suzanu's chest. Fuck me sideways. That crystal is 10 feet thick and cracked from a landing. The crystal in front of me is 15 feet. I can't let the thing slide down here and throw a punch. I'm blowing this thing to kingdom come. If you don't want to get exploded, I suggest you leave out of the back once I open it. I state calmly, hiding my inner panic. Will it kill you? I can give you a solid maybe. And that's only if I bend some of this clear crystal around me to make armor. 
I'm blowing up the white crystal like a tactical nuke. This is enough crystal to turn anyone else into red paste. I respond. I pull all of the crystal at the back of my creation and pull at the front, wrapping it around the Namu and my clear crystal. That thing will be at ground zero if it's the last thing I do. I don't even care that this thing is getting ready to fall apart around me. I was really looking forward to absorbing this thing, but oh well. I pull as much of the clear crystal around me as I can as Aizawa leaps out of the back, his capture device flapping in the wind. I'll handle the leader. I wish I could run too, but I need to make sure this monster doesn't break out at the last second. Goodbye. Boom. 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 Achakos and Momo's heads immediately snap towards the source of the explosion. Izu. Suzu. They turn just in time to see the giant plume of smoke. They can even feel the shockwave slam against them, forcing them backwards as they're buffeted by intense wind and the pebbles it carries. Everyone unfortunate enough to be sitting against the wall, while being healed by the crystals, has their head and back violently shoved against it. Ouch. Is Izuku going to be okay in that explosion? Kirishima asks while rubbing the back of his head. Katsuki is the one to respond. He has to have had a plan before he did that. I know him. He wouldn't have went kamikaze if he knew it'd actually kill him. Something is flying this way. Kirishima announces as he stands up, ready to harden at a moment's notice. That's Izuku in a crystal. Katsuki realizes once the it starts descending. Catch him. After tracing the trajectory and finding the future landing site, Kirishima stands there hardened, feet firmly planted, his arms fully extended. The crystal-coated Izuku slams into Kirishima with enough force to send him skidding back, his feet digging trenches into the stone. It actually turns out that Izuku is only half-coated in crystal. The front half had been blown off during the explosion. Izuku coughs into his arm, spitting up a little bit of blood. Thanks for the catch. He groans as Kirishima sits him on the ground. To him, it feels like every bone in his body is fractured. His brain feels like it's going to split open. That creation took too much mental focus to maintain his current skill level. He won. Achako yells as she runs up and hugs him tight. She plants a quick kiss on his cheek that only Kirishima and Momo sees. Izuku blushes and winces at the same time. She's hugging him a little too tight. Achako eventually releases him and sits down beside him on his right side. Izuku feels two soft objects press against his back. That was pretty awesome. Momo whispers into his left ear. When Izuku turns his head to see her, she plants a quick kiss on his lips, making his light red face turn crimson. Only Kirishima and Achako see this kiss. He quirks an eyebrow at that. He never would have thought Achako and Momo would be attracted to the same type of guy or the same guy for that matter. Momo's beautiful smile makes his heart start pounding. In the back of his mind, he's wondering why nobody has seen the hole in his stomach. The Namu lands not within the student's line of sight. His right arm and lower body are missing, blown off by the explosion. Izuku sighs in relief. It's over. Now Aizawa just has to beat the others. This nightmare will be over soon. At least, it would be if Nama wasn't still moving. You've got to be shitting me, Katsuki groans. The Namu's arm stump and upper half are starting to bubble. With a sickening sound, the Namu's body regenerates. R O O O E R. He has a regeneration quirk too, Izuku thinks before springing onto his feet. Get back. Momo, Kirishima and Achako step away, but remain close enough to intervene if necessary. The Namu is taking slow, methodical steps towards them. Izuku feels safe enough to turn his back because of the distance between them. He has to hit it with something that will completely take it down. If it isn't ash, it can regenerate. Izuku cuts on the device and throws the device onto ground. It spews flames into the air wildly. But Izuku sucks in the fire until the machine stops producing it two minutes later. I hope this is enough, Izuku thinks as he tilts his head back. He chokes on the flames, but persists in pushing down the flames attempting to rush back out. He needs to condense this into a single blast that leaves behind nothing. His stomach is overfilled and burning from the inside. His body is feeling greater and greater pain every second. He has to release it now or he'll burn to death from his own quirk. Boston Blaze Izuku thinks as he tilts his mouth towards the Namu. A ball of blue fire rockets towards the Namu, leaving behind a trail of overheated air. Izuku drops to a knee and exhales enough black smoke to put most smokers to shame. It hurts to open and it hurts to breathe. Izuku coughs spitting up even more blood. Luckily it's hidden by the smoke he's constantly expelling. So Izuku is able to wipe it away and pretend it didn't happen. A moment later, Izuku grips his chest. It feels like there's a hole in his chest. But there's nothing there when Izuku looks down. The flames crackling is the only sound heard for the next minute and a half. No way. Izuku whispers as Namu's lightly burned body emerges from the smoke and flames. It's still walking methodically, like it's in no hurry to reach them. Denki, lightning now. Izuku screams as he stands up. Got it, deputy rep, Denki says as he steps away from the other students. Give me everything you got, Izuku commands. Kaminari shakes his head in bewilderment. All right, 
Izuku is slowly bleeding out the mouth and doesn't even realize it. The flame scorched his tongue and nerves to the point that he can't even taste the distinct metallic flavor of blood or feel the liquid in his mouth. Indiscriminate discharge. The yellow electricity is immediately sucked towards Izuku's gaping maw by a wind funnel. He continuously sucks on the electricity sphere being emitted from Kaminari's body like an endless spaghetti noodle. The wind funnel condensing it into a straight line that enters Izuku's stomach without touching anything along the way. Three minutes later, Izuku's stomach starts to bulge and be electrocuted. It doesn't help that he already has burn wounds littering the walls of his stomach and throat. Okay, that's my limit, Denki says as he cuts the flow of electricity. That's all the electricity he can give without trying his brain. Deku turns around to face the approaching Namu. His stomach bubbles as he prepares to unleash a stream of pure electric death. Zeus Wrath, Izuku thinks as he opens his mouth, unleashing a blue bolt of lightning that deafens him and his classmates, it hurts. He drops down to both knees, clutching his chest. It feels like a stray streak of electricity has latched onto his heart. I can't stop yet, he's still standing. The continuous lightning bolt continues to burrow its way into Namo's chest. After three minutes, the lightning breath stops completely. Izuku stares ahead, waiting to see if his attack stopped Namo. On the bright side, there's a hole in his chest and lightning violently arcing across his body. On the dark side, he's still walking. It's just even slower than before. I failed. Izuku thinks as tears falls from his eyes. Suddenly, his body starts to involuntarily convulse. Blue electricity arcing across his body and through his heart again. This continues for several seconds until they arc into the ground and Izuku coughs up enough blood to make All Might scare. Just as Izuku is about to fall backwards, Momo catches him. Momo, I don't want to go, Izuku weakly whispers. You aren't going anywhere. Momo whispers as she pulls him into her lap. Izuku feels something wet hit his face and he looks up. Momo's crying. Izuku smiles for Momo, one last time. Don't cry, you're prettier when you smile, Izuku says, not wanting the last thing he sees to be the woman he likes in tears, while also not wanting the last memory she has of him being alive to be one where he's visibly in pain. With the last of his strength, Izuku wipes the tears off of her face. He passes out with a genuine smile on his face, a smile for Momo. Izuku, wake up. Wake up. Please, wake up. You're gonna be fine. Momo screams as she shakes him. Kirishima and Achako run up to them, the rest of the students not far behind. They all crowd around the four of them as Kirishima puts his ear in front of Izuku's mouth, no breathing. He puts his hand on Izuku's neck for 15 seconds to check for a pulse, no beats. Tears pour out of Kirishima's eyes. GG guys, I can't feel his heartbeat. He's gone. Okay sadly the chapter is over. And if you enjoyed the video just leave a like. And subscribe with post notification. So when the next chapter is ready, you will be notified. Okay see you in the next video. Bye.